I stood there, sipping my lukewarm coffee, attempting to stay awake after a fourteen-hour drive into the remote wilderness of North Dakota. The sky was that unique shade of gray that signaled an upcoming storm. My name is Jonas Trembley, a fishing enthusiast and part-time guide. I had agreed to lead a small group of inexperienced fishermen, all sporting odd names like Clementine Marshall and Edgardo Gord. We reached the fishing cabin, its rustic exterior matching the dense woods surrounding it. The inside was cozy with well-organized equipment hanging on the dull walls. As we unpacked and changed into our gear, we exchanged pleasantries about our day jobs and families. I mentioned my wife and two kids back home relatable stuff, but not too personal. As we journeyed into the dense forest to reach our fishing spot, I picked up conversations with the group members. They joked about life and ordinary things. It lightened the mood as we were met by thick vegetation that seemed as if it had waited years for someone to stumble into its trap. Strolling along a winding path bordering a shallow stream, Clementine gasped as she noticed something peculiar upstream multiple dead fish floating in grotesque clusters. Their scales shimmered translucent gray tones, as if something had sucked out all the color from them. Tension rippled through everyone's faces. My skepticism encouraged us to continue towards the fishing location in hopes of catching anything but a rising sense of uneasiness. We settled at last beside a picturesque lake, pristine water so clear you could see pebbles resting on its bottom. Above us, leaves rustled gently in the breeze, providing soothing reassurance in contrast to that eerie episode with the fishes earlier. Clementine snagged something substantial, but instead of reeling in a trophy catch like we anticipated, she found herself trapped beneath an enormous creature overpowering her. My heart raced as I witnessed our attacker for the first time. This semi-aquatic beast resembled something from a forgotten era, covered in scales yet bearing limbs resembling a bear's. Its muzzle resembled that of an elongated crocodile, filled with fearsome teeth designed to thwart any predators daring to cross its path. It was unlike anything I had ever seen or heard. In horror, we tried to save Clementine from the animalistic fiend, but it swiped at us violently with its massive claws. Our actions were logical. Our survival instincts kicked in as we fumbled with the fishing equipment unexpectedly transforming into improvised weapons. Still, the fear paralyzed us. We knew that calling for help would be futile in this remote location. Edgardo stumbled backward, tripping over hidden roots and grabbing a gun from his backpack. His hands trembled while aiming at the beast. Give me the strength. He muttered under his breath before pulling the trigger. The creature bellowed in frustration as bullets tore through its flesh but its immense power did not seem diminished in any way. Our hopelessness grew as we realized that not even firearms could put an end to our impending doom. As Edgardo continued to fire at it, and others brandished their newly made weapons, I attempted one last effort, slashing at its legs with a serrated fishing knife. However, our tenacity was futile in the face of this relentless predator. The battle raged on between us humans pitted against a creature bordering on mythical status. The storm clouds converged above our heads announcing their imminent arrival with every clap of thunder or flash of lightning painting our nightmarish encounter more vividly. We continued our struggle against this aggressor using every resource and ounce of strength left pulsing within us knowing that failure was certain doom for ourselves and perhaps others who would dare venture into these lands again unaware of the lurking terror beneath the surface. Our desperation led us to use even the most inconceivable methods to survive the onslaught. One of our crew had a canister of gasoline, and in a split-second decision, we decided to attempt to create a makeshift flamethrower. After all, Fire is often the ultimate enemy for any creature, 
no matter how powerful it may seem. As the monstrous beast lunged towards me, I pulled out a lighter and ignited the gasoline, sending spurts of flame in its direction. It roared in agony as its flesh charred and sizzled under the scorching heat. Left with no choice, it retreated back into the darkness from where it had emerged, leaving us battered and terrified. The others were not so lucky. One of them was caught beneath its heavy foot and crushed to death. We gathered together in shock at what had just occurred, but we knew that staying around for too long would only attract more danger. Guys, did you see that thing? It looked like something straight from Legends, Edgardo exclaimed. We all agreed that none of us had ever heard of such creatures in our lives. Our lack of knowledge about folklore meant we were at an even greater disadvantage. Fear prevented us from calling for help, knowing that it would be useless given our remote location and not wanting to bring more unsuspecting victims into this nightmare. The horrifying experience forced us upon an unforeseen path. Somehow, we needed to figure out what this creature was so that we could prevent future carnage. We headed deeper into the woods and stumbled upon an isolated cabin. With nowhere else to turn, we entered cautiously, hoping it might provide some answers or clues about the attacking beast. Upon entering the cabin, shelves of dusty old books caught our attention. Flipping through them, we found mention of various monsters from folklore stories. None matched our attacker's description, however. Throughout our search, I grabbed a book detailing the local myths and legends in the area we were in. Flipping through its pages, my eyes suddenly widened in terror at an illustration that bore an uncanny resemblance to our relentless predator. As I read further, I discovered it was called the Mordstalker, a monstrous, insatiable predator with strength and speed far beyond human comprehension. Its legend traced back centuries, feared by locals as the ultimate force of destruction. It never showed mercy and left nothing but death and despair in its wake. Despite our newfound knowledge, it did nothing to quell our anxieties. Knowing its name only made us hyper-aware of the danger we were in, and its presence now seemed more real than ever. We decided it was best to devise a plan of escape before being hunted once more. Our priority was to band together— and exit these treacherous lands as safely and quickly as possible. Using improvised weapons, we managed to create traps around our immediate surroundings, hoping they would provide us with valuable time when our pursuer inevitably found us. As expected, nightfall brought the resounding roars that would haunt us forever. With adrenaline pumping and our hearts beating wildly, we charged through the dangerous terrain towards civilization. When the inevitable attack came again, this time we were marginally better prepared. The traps we had laid managed to slow down the creature just enough for us to make a somewhat successful escape. Exhausted and breathless, we finally stumbled upon a road leading towards civilization. Incredulous that we had survived, I looked back one last time at the woods from which we had emerged hoping that our story would serve as a grave warning for future generations to be wary of venturing too deep into unknown territory for fear of awakening the dreaded Mordstalker once again. This happened to me six years ago while traveling through the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. I had always enjoyed hiking, so I thought nothing of exploring a remote trail during my weekend getaway. My name is Daniel Seaver, a 33-year-old mechanic from Pittsburgh. The town at the base of the mountain had only a few hundred residents, all of whom seemed to know each other. I met two other hikers in town, Maya and Sam, a married couple originally from Maine. We agreed to venture out into the wilderness together. The first day of our hike was uneventful. 
We shared stories about our lives. Maya was a nurse, and Sam was an electrician. We laughed together about our common frustrations and listened attentively when one of us shared something more personal. It wasn't until the second day that we stumbled upon something strange. An empty campsite lay abandoned, belongings scattered around as if someone had left in a hurry, or worse, been dragged away. Concerned, we decided to stick closer together and became more cautious as we continued hiking. When night fell, we gathered around a fire for warmth and comfort. The full darkness enveloped us as an unsettling quiet settled around our camp. Maya spoke up first, stating how weird it felt to be surrounded by these silent woods. Sam agreed, unease painting his features. A sudden gunshot pierced through the silent night air like a thunderclap, jolting us from our quiet moment. Panic set in as we scrambled for cover, hiding behind nearby trees and bushes for safety. Before my eyes could adjust to the darkness, I saw a hulking figure emerging from the shadows, heavily built and donning ragged clothes stained with what appeared to be blood. The figure held a rifle and scanned the area intently but said nothing. Fear pulsed through me as I clutched my small pocket knife tightly. I knew I had seen a monster. This being was certainly no ordinary man, and its viciousness was palpable in the moonlight as it stalked the surrounding forest. While Maya, Sam, and I managed to avoid detection for the moment, we knew that we couldn't hide forever. With tense whispers, we agreed to swiftly move through the forest, hoping to outrun whatever menace hunted us. We knew that splitting up would be dangerous, so we clung to each other as we plunged into the darkness. As we moved silently through the dense woods, I couldn't help but frantically look over my shoulder, convinced that at any moment I would see this monstrous figure charging towards us with the hunger of a ruthless predator. We heard the distant sound of shots occasionally ringing out, an unsettling reminder of our impending doom. However, our luck seemed to have run out when Sam let out a pained grunt after stepping on a sharp rock. His yell echoed beyond the trees, surely catching the attention of our relentless pursuer. My heart raced as I sensed danger close by. We didn't have time to tend to Sam's wound. He bit his lip hard and hobbled alongside us as we hurried along, desperately seeking a way out. The looming threat spurred us on, adrenaline replacing fatigue in our battered bodies. In the distance, we spotted what looked like an old building partially hidden amongst the trees, a possible refuge for us to hide in and regroup. Out of options and exhausted beyond measure, we decided to make a break for it. As we began our final sprint towards safety, I couldn't suppress a feeling deep in my gut that something about this situation was disturbingly familiar. As the old building grew closer, we noticed its decayed walls and broken windows. The place seemed abandoned, and though it wasn't an ideal hiding spot, we couldn't be choosy. As I helped Sam limp towards it, I couldn't shake the familiar feeling that haunted me since we started running. I pushed open the creaky door, grimacing as it made a loud noise that could easily alert the mountain men following us. We entered cautiously and found ourselves in a room filled with debris and remnants of furniture. Carefully, we moved deeper into the building, feeling for hidden dangers in the dark. That's when they came, the mountain men. They were tall and burly figures with long disheveled hair and tattered clothes, carrying weapons as brutal as their appearance. A multitude of scars decorated their rugged faces testifying to the life of violence they led. Those men had no trace of humanity left in them searching only to satisfy their insatiable hunger for human flesh. Sam let out a quiet groan as they entered the room. He collapsed onto the floor from exhaustion and pain. The thud he made caught their attention instantly. My heart sank for a moment before instincts kicked in. There was nothing else to do but run. 
As I sprinted through the crumbling building with every ounce of energy left in me, their guttural growls echoed through the corridors, closing in relentlessly. Sam's injury made it impossible for him to stand up and battle against his imminent fate. Just as I thought all was lost, a ray of hope appeared in the form of a narrow window leading outside. Without a second thought, I leaped out headfirst into the cold night air. Seconds later, crashing sounds ensued behind me. These cannibalistic mountain men had one goal in mind catching their prey no matter what it takes. As I made my descent towards some bushes below, I glimpsed one of them coming to the window to pursue me. Fortune favored me when I realized they struggled to fit through the small gap. This gave me precious moments to get away and find help before they figured a way out. I knew that Sam and I couldn't do this alone. We needed help. It was near impossible to call anyone in this remote area, as signal strength was scarce, but I had to try. With hands shaking from fear and exertion, I pulled my phone from my pocket and dialed the emergency number. As it rang, I kept moving, refusing to stop in fear of being caught. Miraculously, someone picked up on the other end. Barely able to catch my breath, I relayed our situation as quickly as possible. While waiting for their arrival, I hid behind some dense foliage just away from the building, lying low. The mountain men eventually exited the structure after finding an alternative route. They sniffed the air, feral eyes scanning around for any signs of prey. My heart pounded violently, but I didn't dare move. Hours later, sirens pierced the silence like a beacon of hope cutting through the darkness of despair. As law enforcement officers approached cautiously, weapons drawn, they found Sam miraculously still alive, grievously injured yet clinging on to life with every ounce of strength he had. The mountain men scattered into the depths of the forest as if they dissolved into the shadows themselves. Their monstrous figures vanished while the officers attended to Sam's injuries and called for backup. Though none of us could have anticipated those terrifying events, we lived to see another day all because of courage and determination in those moments where it mattered most. As days passed into weeks, my mind often wandered back to that harrowing night when we scrambled for survival against bloodthirsty fiends masquerading as human beings themselves. Authorities continued their search and investigation regarding the cannibalistic mountain men. In the aftermath, a veil of bitter reminders slipped over our lives like an invisible shadow. Memories of that dreadful encounter haunted us in different ways Sam's wounds healed but left gruesome scars as a constant reminder of the night, whereas my psyche bore the marks of a familiar darkness I couldn't quite place. Regardless, we prevailed and emerged from this nightmare— as changed people who will never forget how close we came to death's door that fateful night or the whispered prayers for rescue we held so dearly in our hearts. This happened to me about 15 years ago in the dense woods of northern Minnesota. My name is Jedediah Klump, and as a forest worker, I spent most days maintaining trails and checking for any signs of fire hazards. That day, the air had a stillness that seemed too quiet, but I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks on me. It was just another ordinary day when my colleague Carlotta Schmidt found something odd while working further up the trail. She was mumbling to herself when I approached her noticing pieces of human clothing scattered on the ground. We assumed there must have been a group of careless hikers or pranksters who left them there. Sharing a quick laugh about teenagers these days, we continued our work but soon discovered other bizarre occurrences. There were shattered remnants of camping gear, and blood stains began appearing on various tree trunks. Our laughter slowly transitioned into concern for whoever might have met an unfortunate fate in these woods. 
We decided to walk deeper into the forest to see if there were any missing persons nearby or clues regarding their disappearance. The moments passed tensely as we meticulously scanned the area, finding more signs of violence and unrest. The air around us felt heavy, our chest tightening with each step we took. With furrowed brows, we whispered to each other about what could possibly be happening in our little corner of the world that was usually so serene and peaceful. A chilling scream interrupted our thoughts from a great distance. Fear washed over both Carlotta and me as we discussed whether or not to call for help. We hesitated because we didn't want to jump to conclusions or cause unnecessary panic without proper evidence. Determined to make sense of this anomaly ourselves before bringing in outsiders, we found the resolve to continue forward. As seasoned forest workers, instinct guided us well in these woods, except today, it seemed that even our instincts were giving way to a growing uneasiness. We discovered a peculiar set of tracks that didn't match any animal we were familiar with in the region. They were too large to belong even to a bear and there was an additional claw mark we couldn't place. In our heart of hearts, we knew the forest held an unknown creature responsible for the horrors we'd encountered today. Time moved slowly as our surroundings seemed to whisper warnings, urging us to turn back. As our resolve waned with each minute, guiding us towards retreat, fate intervened. Through the trees ahead, we caught sight of a hulking figure dragging lifeless forms behind it. My heart dropped when I recognized one face among the carnage, our co-worker Hank Levesque. My initial shock gave way to sheer terror as I laid eyes upon the creature responsible for these abominations. Its massive figure towered over us, covered in fur intermingled with thick, leather-like skin and gnarled muscle. It had arms with too many joints, longer than its enormous thighs and ending with those vicious claws I saw earlier in its tracks. The sight was beyond anything I'd ever imagined or believed could exist. Overwhelmed by what was before us and the pain of losing Hank, all logic faded from my thoughts as I grabbed my firearm without warning Carlotta, who lingered nearby while contemplating an escape strategy. My decision set into motion a sequence of uncontrollable events. The shot rang out loudly, echoing through the trees as it struck the beast's deltoid. Fury ignited in its unsettlingly human-like eyes as it screamed in response. The creature's rage turned its attention towards us. Carlotta and I exchanged panicked glances, knowing we had to come up with a plan, and fast. Our only option was to flee and find safety, hoping to get far enough away from this monster before it could cause more harm. We sprinted between the trees, stumbling over the terrain as our pursuer followed relentlessly. Carlotta shouted for me to keep going while she lagged behind, hoping to buy time for us both. However, there wasn't any time for thinking. I knew weapons wouldn't stop it, but I couldn't just leave her behind. I fired several more shots at the beast, aiming for its legs in an attempt to slow it down. Though my bullets hit their mark, the creature didn't even seem phased. Instead, its frenzied scream echoed through the forest as it continued gaining on us. Suddenly, we arrived at a cliff's edge overlooking a ravine. Our only way out was to jump or double back into certain death. In those frantic moments, neither of us hesitated. We leaped off the cliff and plunged into the freezing waters below. Miraculously, we managed to surface and swim towards the shore despite our injuries. Once on solid ground, we assessed our situation, hypothermic and miles from any help in dense wilderness with an unknown monster after us. However grim our predicament appeared, we decided to move forward rather than give up. We knew civilization lay north along the riverbank. If we followed it long enough, eventually somebody would find us, or save us. 
Hours passed as we trudged in silence through the forest landscape until we chanced upon an old ranger station long thought abandoned. Seeking respite from our nightmare, we entered and found workable walkie-talkies on dusty shelves among old outdated maps. Carlotta grabbed one walkie-talkie while I took the other. She glanced at the lifeless body we discovered in a corner, a silent reminder that nowhere was truly safe. Nodding at each other, we tried to reach out for help with the devices. This is an emergency. Are there any park rangers or rescue teams within range? I shouted into the static-filled connection, despair evident in my voice. My persistence paid off. After several attempts, we finally made contact with a nearby ranger team patrolling another part of the forest. Ranger Dispatch they replied. Can you provide your location? Old Ranger Station near the ravine. I managed to choke out. Please hurry. There's something, someone dangerous after us. The Ranger assured us help was on the way but warned that given our remote location, their arrival would take time. Nervously, Carlotta and I fortified ourselves inside while waiting for rescue that felt like an eternity away. As night fell, there was no further sign of our monstrous pursuer. Our hope grew that perhaps it had abandoned its chase or become lost among the endless trees. Soon enough, headlights pierced through the darkness as vehicles approached and finally ground to a halt outside. Armed with precaution and equipment, park rangers led us away from our nightmare and back to civilization. After being checked over by doctors who treated our hypothermia and injuries, we shared our harrowing experience. No official records or past reports could illuminate this beast's existence, leaving only unanswered questions and haunting memories in its wake. In memory of Hank Levesque and others lost to an unknown menace lurking in the shadows of safety, all we can do is remember them with gratitude for their friendship and devotion to their work men dedicated to studying nature's mysteries but unprepared for the horror that lies beneath its beautiful facade. And together, Carlotta and I will continue onwards, survivors joined by tragedy and a never-ending quest to understand our world's darkest secrets. I'm Martin Lowry, and I never believed in the paranormal. But that changed when I stumbled upon something beyond my wildest imagination. I'm a detective for the police department in Sedona, Arizona, a quaint and scenic town known for its red rocks. After a long day at work, I like to indulge in a moment of solace, watching the sunset blend into the rocky horizon. One day after work, I met my friend, Amelia Sanders. She was unusually quiet. When I broke the silence with a lame joke about my boss's tie choices, she just managed a weak smirk before she started telling me about her brother, Christopher Sanders, who had gone missing two days prior without any trace or reason. As we were old friends and present colleagues in the force, Without thinking twice, we decided to spend our time off pursuing leads on Christopher. What had begun as somewhat of a routine missing persons case slowly morphed into an intricate mystery. People had reported witnessing something sinister lurking in the shadows around Sedona. One afternoon, Amelia received an anonymous tip directing her to an abandoned warehouse near our local airport. We decided to investigate further. As we entered that vast empty space, its musty smell filled our noses. The dilapidated walls and broken windows were evidence of years of neglect since it was last used for storage. We moved cautiously through the dark space as the wind whistled through its open gaps. At that eerie moment, both Amelia and I thought we saw something odd on the far side of this warehouse. A large silhouette hunched over something which suggested even bigger monstrous proportions. 
as we approached closer with drawn weapons following police protocols dreading what could be before us but ensuring safety first golden rule. Our eyes began to adjust more so as we scrutinized details that were pure horror twisted visage. This creature had scaly green skin with razor-sharp teeth extending from its enlarged jaw, and its eyes glowed amber with a malevolence that sent shudders down our spines. Long talons had effortlessly carved into what seemed to be the remains of a human. Those limbs were not only proportionately wrong, but the absence of any clothing heightened the gruesome scene. We carefully backed away from the creature without attracting its attention. Once outside the warehouse, Amelia and I decided to call for backup which entailed involving FBI Hazardous Materials Response Unit, who had prior experience in dealing with unexplained occurrences. Some jokes about an extraterrestrial cleanup crew making the FBI's worst-kept secret aided in calming our nerves while we waited by our parked cars. Sweltering heat disrupted those rare moments of humor that evening as we continued to recall horror inside every now and then staring back towards warehouse lost for explanations or motives behind it all. Backup arrived promptly, yet they remained hesitant at first as if second-guessing adhering standard protocols before fully prepared entering building edge lit by flashing red-blue lights creating surreal contrasting effect against Sedona's famous crimson rocky backdrop watched from afar there which only increased nervous tension amongst ourselves too. As the flickering lights of the FBI Hazardous Materials Response Unit illuminated the area, we stood as far back as possible allowing them to do their work. Amelia tapped her foot nervously, her gaze never leaving the warehouse. The agents moved with purpose, knowing they were dealing with something out of the ordinary. Listen, I muttered to Amelia after a brief period of silence. The creature in there is nothing like we've ever seen before. We need to ensure our own safety and make sure none of us are left alone till this thing is contained. She nodded and whispered back. Do you think they'll be able to detain it? I shook my head, expressing my uncertainty. If that creature can tear apart a person with such ease, what's stopping it from breaking free? We have no idea what it's capable of. We watched as a team of agents cautiously approached the warehouse with a large metallic cage and specialized equipment. It appeared as though they were planning on capturing the creature alive. This was undoubtedly a risky move, but one they deemed necessary. A call came over our radios, requesting us to stand by for further instructions. Amelia and I glanced at each other but didn't exchange any words. The tension in the air was palpable, a sense of unease that seemed to overwhelm every single agent present. Suddenly... We heard yelling and several gunshots fired from inside the warehouse. Panic set in as agents rushed into the building to provide assistance. Amelia gripped her weapon tighter, glancing nervously at me for guidance. It's escalating quickly. Should we go in? She asked hesitantly. No, I replied firmly. Our priority is to ensure no civilians get hurt and that this thing does not escape that warehouse. We maintained our positions outside as more backup responded hurriedly to the scene. The sounds from inside became a cacophony of destruction, breaking glass, loud crashes, and desperate shouts from the agents. The creature was fighting back with ferocious power, all the while screeching its unnatural wails at an ear-piercing volume. Just when we thought it couldn't get any worse, a truck rammed through the warehouse's wall, sending brick and debris flying in every direction. Horrified, we watched as the creature leaped onto the vehicle and began tearing it apart. The agents backed away and fired their weapons at the reptilian aggressor, but the bullets seemed to have minimal effect aside from angering it further. As it became clear that physical strength would not be enough to stop this opponent, one agent hurled a gas grenade at the creature. The gas began to emit a billowing cloud of smoke surrounding and engulfing it. 
The creature let out an agitated hiss before finally collapsing onto the ground. Agents quickly converged on its unconscious form, restraining it with chains and securing it within the metallic cage. Despite its terrifying power, the creature was finally contained, for now. A senior agent approached Amelia and me with a wary expression. We'll transport this thing to a more secure facility where we can study it further, he said. Unfortunately, two agents were injured in there, Jones and Taylor, but they'll pull through. Amelia and I exchanged somber expressions as we learned about our colleagues' injuries. In the meantime, the agent continued, We need you both to head back to headquarters for debriefing. We don't want word spreading about what happened here. With heavy hearts, we complied and prepared to leave the scene. The adrenaline pumping through our veins started to wane as fatigue set in, a result of confronting something entirely beyond our comprehension. As we apprehensively left Sedona behind us in silence, questions about this ordeal raced through my mind. What exactly was that creature? How did it get here? What did it want? Although I knew countless reports and investigations would follow in the coming days, those questions remained unanswered, and I couldn't shake the fear of what this could mean for our future. With each passing mile, our ordinary lives seemed to fade further into the ether, replaced by the gruesome reality of something dreadful lurking in the shadows, maybe even closer than we realized. On Nolan Finch, a small-town cop in Wesley, Alaska. Life is simple here. We take care of each other. Yesterday began like any other work day. I swung by Mary Jane's diner, where everyone knows my name and greeted the owners warmly. Throughout the day, I glided through the mundane tasks typical for this sleepy town. The dispatcher shared information about a disturbance at the local park. Just routine work, I thought, and made my way there. Arriving on scene, I noticed several bystanders who had taken cover and were whispering nervously among themselves. What's going on? I asked, as one of the bystanders pointed to a secluded corner of the park. As I approached, I caught sight of a scene seemingly etched out of a nightmare. Elmo Preston, our trusted mailman, lay lifeless next to an ancient oak tree. His clothes were tattered, and his eyes bulged out in terror, a chilling sight like nothing I'd encountered before. I told everyone to step back while calling for backup and medical assistance. With no concrete evidence of what transpired or who could have caused such harm, we knew securing the scene was necessary. Our investigation began with questioning witnesses. It was Jimmy Hanniger, said Doris Pritchett through her tears. Our hands full with Jimmy Hanniger, a local troublemaker we arrested numerous times over the years for petty crimes, but nothing remotely close to this level of violence. I saw him lurking near the far side of the park before it happened, Doris insisted. Hours later, our search for Jimmy failed due to lack of hard evidence connecting him to Elmo's death. Little did I know that night would signal the start of relentless chaos in Wesley, as disappearances began to mount quickly. Popular high school teacher Silas Carbuncle vanished while heading home from a parent-teacher conference, and brothers Troy and Daxton Jankowski went missing during a fishing trip. I tried to reassure folks we'd restore peace soon. They remained skeptical, and it was clear that my usual calm demeanor had been shattered by recent events. During the third night of our desperate search, I was patrolling near the old Stenson quarry when something caught my eye. In the dim moonlight, I noticed the unmistakable silhouette of a creature making its way across the quarry floor. My heart raced as I followed from a safe distance. The grotesque beast differed wildly from anything I'd encountered before. 
It stood on four muscular legs, covered with scaly skin like some prehistoric era reject. Gnashing rows of teeth jutted from a wide, flat mouth ripe for tearing flesh. It moved with swift determination as if it knew exactly where it sought its next victim. Feeling both appalled and intrigued, I radioed my trusted colleague Officer Zachariah Delmont to share my findings. Zach arrived immediately, saw what I saw, and drew his weapon. Think this is what's been taking our people? Zach asked in hushed urgency. I'm not sure about Jimmy Hanniger, I whispered back, but it looks like trouble. Zach and I monitored the creature from a safe distance watching as it sniffed the ground like a bloodhound. Suddenly it turned its head in our direction, and those piercing eyes seemed to lock onto us. My instincts shouted at me to call for backup, but my mouth remained shut. I knew if we brought more officers down here, it would put them all in danger. The creature let out a deafening roar before charging towards us, its powerful limbs propelling it across the quarry in seconds. In response, Zack squeezed the trigger of his gun. The bullet seemed to have no effect, only adding to the monster's fury. Run! I yelled, scrambling up the side of the quarry while Zack continued to fire at the coming terror. As we ran across the rocky terrain, glancing back regularly to ensure we weren't being followed, we finally climbed over a ridge and lost sight of our pursuer. We both caught our breath while frantically trying to come up with an escape plan. A part of me wanted to turn around and go face off against the creature myself, but I knew better than to act rashly. We needed help, not just any backup, but experts in dealing with situations like this. As impossible as it seemed, I called in for specialized assistance. After explaining what we encountered at the quarry as best as I could without sounding insane, monstrous beasts with hard scaly skin and rows of sharpened teeth, they agreed to come right away. Over the next couple of days, tensions remained high in Wesley as more people went missing. Silas Carbuncle's abandoned car was discovered on a deserted road not far from where Troy and Daxton Jankowski had disappeared. The grisly scenes sent shockwaves through our community. Streaks of blood were smeared across the pavement, and vacant windows screamed with desperation. Finally, help arrived in the form of a specialized team from out of state. They went straight to the quarry, with Zack and I in tow. Armed with advanced technology, they were able to detect and analyze the air for traces of substances emitted by the creature. It appeared to be some sort of hybrid between a lizard and an apex predator, though its origin remained uncertain. We can't continue like this, one of the specialists told us grimly. We must do something before more people are killed. I couldn't agree more. But the situation only seemed to grow more complicated as our new allies discovered evidence that these creatures, yes, there was more than one, had been intentionally released into the quarry. Why? What could anyone possibly gain from such carnage? I wondered aloud, but there was no satisfactory answer. With each passing moment my fear grew. For my comrades, for my family, for myself— we had to find a way to stop these creatures and solve the mystery of their origin before it consumed us all. Under the guidance of the specialists, we tracked the carnivorous beasts using their technology. With dread hanging heavy over our heads, we discovered their lair, an abandoned industrial complex near the quarry where they had been living and feeding on unsuspecting prey. Against our better judgment, and ignoring every instinct that ordered us not to engage, we prepared to enter the complex. We all understood it was do or die. If we didn't take action now, our town's future would be lost for good. As predicted, the battle against these insidious creatures was fierce and gruesome. We fought tooth and nail but ultimately came out victorious. Too many lives were lost during this chilling ordeal 
but if we hadn't stepped up when we did, there may have been none left alive at all. Like throwing a veil over a traumatic event that too many had witnessed firsthand or felt in their heartache for lives lost too soon, the team of specialists cleared the town of any remaining evidence of the unspeakable horror, leaving only each individual's harrowing memories in its wake. In the weeks that followed, as our community attempted to heal and rebuild the lives that had been so brutally uprooted in our struggle for survival, two things remained uncertain. What exalted nightmare could have driven the creature's release in the first place? And what unspeakable terror would be unleashed upon us if their secrets were ever uncovered? One can only pray these questions never find their answers. I remember my first shift as a fire lookout in the dense forests of New Hampshire vividly. The job promised solitude and peace, a respite from my life cluttered with failures. My name, Everest, seemed ironic, given how low I felt taking this position. Upon arrival at the tower, I unpacked my essentials books, coffee, and some family photos that tied me to what I'd left behind. It was night five when the stillness shattered. My radio crackled to life with an urgency that belied the still expanse of trees before me. A strangled message came through from a fellow lookout miles away, named Juniper. Someone or something is out there. It's not an animal, and it doesn't speak. It watches. The transmission ended abruptly leaving me with a heavy silence and eyes reflexively scanning the horizon. Over the course of several days, more reports ensued. Distant sightings, strange marks on trees, personal items inexplicably moved overnight. Despite being armed only with binoculars and my wits, I began documenting these anomalies meticulously. My eighteenth day marked a turning point. At dawn's light... As I sipped my black coffee gazing out at the vast green carpet below me, I saw it evidence that something had indeed traversed our protected land. The sight was disquieting a carcass of what appeared to be a deer, but it was mangled in a way that suggested intelligence behind its brutal demise. The unease crawled under my skin, yet my curiosity persisted like an itch as perversely alluring as it was terrifying. Nightfall brought whispers along the wind not words but breaths of someone or something circling around beneath where I watched fervently from above. I whispered updates to Juniper over the radio during these nocturnal hours. With humor edging her voice tinged with fear she joke, Better not be flirting with whatever thinks were its new prey. Attempting to undercut the palpable dread. Subsequent nights filled with rustlings close to my lookout tower chiseled away at any composure. Routines became rituals meant to stave off panic. Chores were carried out while my back never faced an open window longer than necessary. When day 23 arrived with a fog dense enough to swallow sounds and shapes whole, my sense of impending dread intensified speckled by every brief brushing sound outside my provisional haven. It was nightfall when fear crystallized into reality. I had stepped outside for fresh air when all at once silence struck. Even the usual nighttime symphony of insects had ceased as if in anticipation of something grim. A figure loomed at the edge of visibility, indistinct but undeniably there and focused on me, as real as the tower under my feet and just as unyielding. Rushing indoors and barricading myself felt both cowardly and the only sane thing to do. Juniper's voice came sporadically now. Her jokes faded into terse updates ridden with shared terror. I resolved to wait until morning's light offered visibility before taking action. Whether that would mean an escape attempt or confrontation remained undecided in my paralyzed state but dawn would prove itself too far a lifeline when an abrupt crash against the wooden structure signaled an unspeakable intent from whatever lurked beyond walls too thin for comfort. 
The crash shattered the silence and my resolve. No more waiting. I grabbed the radio, heart drumming like a trapped animal inside my chest. Juniper, it's trying to break in. I spoke breathless. Static hissed back before Juniper's voice sharpened by urgency cut through. Lock everything. We're getting you out. I scanned the room. The radio might help, but rescue would take time. Too much time. Fumbling through darkness, I secured every possible entry point. Then came a slow, deliberate thump from below, distinct from the random creaks of wood settling. It stalked with purpose, pacing around the tower base. Sunrise was an eternity away, so I watched through gaps in the wood planks until it moved into view, a shadow outlined by moonlight that obscured any definitive shape. It had limbs, long and wrong as if joints bent where none should exist. Skin, or what seemed like it, glistened wetly against the dim light. Its head occasionally tilted upwards as if tasting my scent in the breeze. Time lost meaning as I traced its predatory circuit around my sanctuary. The violence of its intentions demanded no translation when each crash against walls illustrated desire for my demise. As lighter hues signal morning's approach, so did the reality of isolation's razor edge. They're sending someone. Juniper promised over crackling waves. With daybreak came visibility and false confidence in numbers despite knowing help was still hours away, until movement ceased below and left me clinging to hollow silence once more. It struck then, a barrage against the door that no bolt could withstand forever. Each impact a grotesque announcement of hunger made manifest. Almost there. Juniper's words bore desperation now as much as my own grip on strained hope. When rescuers arrived, there was no trace but disturbed soil and splintered wood, evidence of a night-long siege and violent intent from a creature unnameable but undeniably flesh and blood. And amidst relief at survival was mourning for Juniper, found mere meters from safety, succumbed not to fable beasts but an all-too-real one its existence now undeniable to me and sealed with her sacrifice. The story began with dread. It ended with loss etched into wakeful nights whenever shadows danced just beyond understanding's fragile reach. I remember the day I traded the city's clamor for the silence of the Gila National Forest, seeking solace and solitude as a fire lookout. The expanse of New Mexico's wilderness promised calm, yet as I traveled deeper, that promise began to wilt like leaves at summer's end. Tending my tower, I'd spend hours scanning horizons, my only companions being the occasional calls of distant birds or winds whispering secrets through pine needles. By week three, isolation weighed heavy, a familiar comfort warping into something chilling. One crisp morning while trekking a lesser-known path for maintenance, I found patterns in the dirt, wide and scattered like overzealous steps. Must have been from an animal. The thought flittered away as unremarkable, until that night. Disembodied sounds clawed at my sanctuary. Thuds reverberated through the floorboards, halting just when sleep dared to claim me. Coffee became my crutch, and with it came clarity, or perhaps heightened paranoia. Whispers of Fielding's disappearance years prior tickled the edges of my memory, a seasoned ranger who one day didn't return from his patrol. They never found him, nor any trace, just an open journal with mundane entries before blank pages swallowed his story. The following dusk introduced a stench so potent it seeped through the woodwork of my cabin. A visceral warning urged me to remain inside even as daylight lingered on the horizon. Peering below summoned visions of fielding, earth swallowing his strides as he ventured into unknown tangles. Then came footprints— 
conspicuous in their size and number. Crouched beside one such imprint at dawn revealed its depth. It was recent. My pulse thrummed a relentless rhythm as I traced its outline when laughter shattered silence. Not merry, but mocking, a man's voice cutting cold through fog banks. Baxter, a poacher's name I'd heard whispered among locals back in town, rare enough to stick yet sullied by deeds crueler than hunting forbidden game, now adorned this specter haunting memories and present alike. Dialogue with phantom threats proved futile and radio communications failed to penetrate an unseen veil that fell upon these woods, an eerie reprieve rendering pleas silent while warning echoes remained absently present. Moments crystallized as precious when nighttime grew bolder. Shadows stretched longer than nature intended. The small window framing constellations once comforted stories high above ground. Now it framed insecurities born from tales untold, a contrast between voids celestial and terrestrial. Clarity waned thin as exhaustion gripped tighter. Leaves rustling against each other morphed into hushed conspiracies while branches that tapped against pain sang dirges for sanity's retreat. On the twenty-seventh evening, moonlight betrayed evidence of a gruesome feast not but a mile from where I once laid my trust in these woods' embrace. Evidence suggested more voracious than curious. Flesh rendered unevenly from bone, devoid of sense yet meticulous in grotesqueness. Nature had no hand in this tableau macabre. Panic latched onto thoughts while preparations made for escape felt futile. Every crunch beneath boots echoed Fielding's silent steps. A realization crept upon me then. A watcher watched. Observant roles reversed under this canopy wherein man involuntarily compliments flora and fauna alike. Insidious anticipation gnawed at peace with each sunset's retreat. Nights lengthening as if relishing the game presented within their shroud. A stoic facade seemed requisite lest emotions betray location before time allotted for departure ripened. As moon cast omniscient glow upon treetops lending peculiar shadows motion beyond breezes choreography, ill-timed humor fluttered across mind. I scribbled coordinates on a map a last-ditch effort to alert authorities without giving voice to my dread. The nearest ranger station lay miles away, through dense woodland, but I had to try. I left at dawn, treading lightly. I avoided the path where I had found the remains, instead navigating by compass and the now ominous silhouettes of trees against the lightning sky. The forest remained silent save for my steps until a sound stopped me cold a low, rhythmic growl from behind. I turned to see it, tall and hunched, with matted fur that hung in heavy clumps. Its eyes reflected a malice no animals should. Thick saliva dripped from its sharpened teeth as it took deliberate steps towards me. I broke into a run. I heard the creature give chase, foliage cracking under its weight. Branches caught at my clothes like hands grasping to drag me back. It was nearly upon me when I burst into the clearing of the ranger station. I pounded on the door, voiceless screams trapped in my throat. The door swung open. A ranger appeared, his expression shifting from annoyance to alarm as he took in my state and the sounds from just beyond the trees. We barricaded ourselves in and called for backup. It was over an hour before help arrived, armed officers who entered the forest to find what pursued me. They returned with grim faces. They didn't catch it but found signs of its presence all along my panicked route, a trail of disarray pointing back towards the cabin. I couldn't go back there. They offered me a ride to town and promised to send a team to investigate further. In that car leaving everything behind, I accepted that there are horrors in this world beyond understanding, beasts that defy explanation and sit outside natural order. As we drove away, only one thing became certain. I was lucky to be alive, another gory scene prevented by mere steps, 
and something unnameable now roamed those woods unchecked. I always did enjoy silence, the sort that engulfs you in the far-reaching corners of Pine Barrens Reserve. My name is Silas Greaves, a park ranger who patrolled this part of New Jersey, where towns are sparse and legends many. It was a routine inspection past Devies Creek, named after some forgotten folk hero, when the first sign appeared, a neatly arrayed circle of wildflowers, their stems cut clean. The day was bright, and the woods teemed with life. Birds chirped in rhythm as I made my way through the thick brush, my radio crackling periodically with static. The peacefulness was disrupted only by a distant scream. The sound wasn't human. I knew every cry an animal could make here, but this? It chilled me for reasons I couldn't place. I met Samson Haight and Isla Zanetti at the outpost. They were volunteers assigned to the northern trails. Neither had been here long enough to lose their wonder for the sprawling wilderness that was my second home since I left the bustling streets of Camden years ago. We shared a light-hearted joke about townies getting lost on straight paths before they set out with their map and compass. The sound haunted me even as dusk approached and painted shadows longer on the bark of pines. I remained vigilant, scanning every inch for anomalies. It wasn't until I spotted prints unlike any creatures known to these woods that my skepticism turned to concern. Unidentifiable, they were too large for a bear and had strange gaps where claws should have been. As night enveloped the forest in darkness, an unease settled within me. There was a rustle near a thicket, and Isla's voice crackled over the radio pleading for assistance. Static made her words almost unintelligible but panic unmistakable. Without another thought, I broke into a run toward where I had seen them last. Hoarse breaths escaped me as I moved with urgency unheard by those distant from danger or responsibility. Each stride brought me deeper into territory marked with more bizarre signs. Trees scratched at unnatural heights and whispers that seemed to dance around from nowhere. Then there was silence again, not peaceful, but pressing, when I arrived at where Isla's distress call originated from. Only Samson was there, pale and shaken beside an empty space where Isla should have been. Words spilled from him nonsensically. Gone, darkness, it took her. We searched for hours finding no further trace beyond mangled gear strewn beneath an old oak tree as if dropped from above. Frustration mounted within me, no drops of blood, no further screams, just vanishing into thin air. I knew by protocol we should call in law enforcement for missing persons, but there was doubt stirring in my gut like waking beasts we were beyond what training prepared us for. Something lurked between reality and folklore out here. The moon glowed ominously high when it showed itself from behind cloud cover. Samson barely whispered warnings of what he saw take Isla descriptions not fitting any earthly being but closer to nightmarish tales spun by locals around campfires. Our radios were now only capable of emitting useless bursts of noise. Our only option left was to continue search on foot hoping beyond hope to find Isla or any clue pointing toward her whereabouts. With Samson beside me, we pushed through the thick underbrush. There was a need to find Isla, despite knowing that neither of us could explain her disappearance. I glanced at my watch. Three hours had passed since Isla's last known contact. We both knew the risks of being in these woods after dark, but our only thought was to find her. We stepped over twisted roots and avoided pits that could be more than they seemed. There was no more talk. Each breath came out visible in the cold air. I checked my phone. No signal. Samson indicated his was the same. We reached a clearing. That's when I saw it. Tall, mangled, fur matted with an unknown substance. 
eyes reflecting moonlight with a predatory gaze. It towered over us, limbs contorted at disturbing angles, giving it an erratic motion as it moved. It lunged at Samson, teeth bared. I heard fabric tear, a scream cut through the night air. Samson fell to the ground. The creature turned its gaze toward me and approached with calculated malice. I ran. The need to escape overpowered everything else. Every step was driven by survival instinct, not bravery. Logic told me that this wasn't an animal attack. Animals don't move like that, don't target like that. Samson had a gun. He could defend himself if he recovered in time. I could not help him now without risking the same fate as Isla's. Silent evidence beneath an indifferent oak tree. Ahead I saw lights from our base camp. Others were there, safe and unaware of what lurked beyond their view. I broke through the tree lean, gasping for air, and relayed what happened in broken sentences to those gathered around. They mobilized immediately, some tending to my disheveled state, while others formed a rescue team armed with more than just flashlights. Law enforcement arrived within twenty minutes after the alert went out from our camp's landline phone, mobile still useless deep in this wilderness that held secrets beyond human understanding. They found Samson not far from where I left him, lifeless eyes staring at nothingness, his body a testament to the cruel efficiency of whatever hunted these woods. Rescue dogs tracked down Isla's scent but it vanished just as abruptly as she did, no further clues as to her fate or whereabouts. Days passed as local authorities scoured the area while we were instructed to leave for safety reasons and mental anguish considerations given Samson's graphic end and Isla's unknown one. On departing day, they found scraps of fur considered to belong to no local species and tracks that confused even seasoned trackers, resembling those large enough for mythic beasts yet undiscovered by science or filed under extinct millennia ago. The sunset cast long shadows over trees as we exited the territory marked with mysteries, nightmare fuel for generations unfamiliar with such unexplained phenomena or creatures defying classification, something between lost history and reluctant future studies. We left behind gear and two friends taken by a beast of undeniable reality yet impossible taxonomy. Lost voices now part of woodland whispers alongside stories told with cautionary tones for those bold or foolish enough to walk these parts come nightfall again. It was just another long haul across the country, keeping to the rhythm of the rumbling engine beneath me, and the white lines zipping by. My name is Kalen Eberhardt, a moniker as rare as the moments of peace on the road. Those fleeting respites were treasured, for life behind the wheel was a solitude only broken by the grimy diners and transient rest stops along the interstate. I was navigating through Vigo County, Indiana, threading through its patchwork of fields and forests like countless times before. Yet this trip was destined for deviation. A few miles past Terre Haute, I noticed my rig pulling oddly. A tire was giving up on me. With a sigh heavy with pragmatism rather than resentment, I pulled off into an abandoned stretch by an old grain silo that stood like an ancient sentinel watching over fallow land. Diligence shaped my routine check not just for my own safety— but it's ingrained habit hewn by years on these roads. That's when I first noticed something off about the silo. While its structure remained static in its desolation, there was a freshness to a set of tracks leading around its base that whispered recent activity. Before I contended with my tire, curiosity tugged me towards the structure. Work could wait when tinged with such peculiarity. The door hung loosely on its hinges as if it pleaded in silence for someone to wrench it open and dispel its hidden truths. Beyond that threshold lay darkness dense enough to stifle sound. 
My flashlight cut through picking up dust motes that danced their eternal dance unfazed by my intrusion. But it wasn't until I landed my beam on what lay sprawled across a decayed and broken-down conveyor belt that I felt the staccato drumbeat of my heart take pace. Amongst webs and waste were articles of clothing, torn, bloodied, a gruesome mosaic stitched together by violence. The immediacy of what should have been done contacting authorities ricocheted away from action due to non-existent cell service a common nemesis in these rural stretches. A trucker learns to rely on self more than signal, yet tranquility had abandoned this enclave meant for grains, not gore. Stealing myself against the panic that sought attention at the edge of my senses, I returned to repair my rig as fast as proficiency allowed. This place now held an unsavory taint it demanded departure post-haste if only instinct heeded. That's when he emerged. Silent as shadow but defined in the stark contrast between light and dark, a man marked with grit, and something untamed striding purposively toward me from where I ventured too willingly before. He was tall, broad-shouldered with hands that told their own tales of toil. Or trouble, his gaze unwavering and fixed upon me with an intensity born from unknown intent. There were no introductions nor exchanges. His presence alone embodied confrontation, an unvoiced threat manifesting with each deliberate step closer to where I stood rooted beside my truck unsure whether fight or flight should seize these trembling bones. I fumbled for the tire iron, the only weapon I could think of. My fingers closed around its cold metal just as he neared. The man's eyes were hard, cold, lifeless windows to a soul that seemed unfamiliar with mercy. Need help? His voice cut through the quiet and sharp contrast to his silent approach. Instinct screamed, lie. No, I'm fine. You sure? He took another step. Yes. I kept my grip on the tire iron, hidden from view. He nodded once as if satisfied with my response or my fear. Then he turned and walked back toward the dark from which he'd come. I watched his form disappear, each step deliberate and even. Once he was out of sight, I tossed the tire iron back into the truck and climbed into the cabin. Locks clicked into place at the press of a button. I turned the key in the ignition, foot heavy on the accelerator, as the truck roared to life. I drove until houses became frequent and lights more common. At a gas station with a working payphone outside, I stopped. Hands shaking, I called the police. There's been an attack. I reported as clearly as possible, describing what I saw without mentioning how it chilled me to my core. Sirens wailed in the distance as they approached where it all happened their red and blue lights weaving through darkness to find what remained of tranquility in that forsaken stretch of road. In days that followed, news broke of a fugitive captured, a man wanted for scenes resembling my discovery. They called him Reese Malam in reports, his history traced through a web of violence only now coming to light after his arrest. I kept driving those rural roads— delivering cargo from one place to another. Life persisted with its relentless pace, and so did I. Yet at times I wondered about Reese, about how close evil had been without making itself fully known to me. The victims' names were mentioned often, a requiem for those lost, a list too long for any heart not hardened by such repetition. Endings are seldom neat, tied up with bows or understanding. Mine was no different, just another mile passed on an endless road, a chapter concluded leaving ragged edges rather than resolution. But it ended with me alive, carrying stories scarred into memory without leaving their marks upon my flesh, a victim who escaped simply by virtue of circumstance and unspoken fear.
Every morning before the sun peeks over the horizon, I hook up my rig and prepare for the day's haul. My name is Jethro Kane, a trucker by trade, and solitude is my constant companion on these long stretches of road. Heavily laden with cargo, my truck rumbles to life, eager to devour mile after endless mile of asphalt. The true charm of this job isn't just the scenery or the freedom. It's the stories that etch themselves into every highway and byway, stories that beg to be shared over a lonely diner meal. On one such trip through the remote forests of Oregon, my CB radio crackled with chatter, a rare occurrence given the sparse population in these parts. Static-laden inquiries went unanswered. It was as if someone was intentionally broadcasting silence rather than seeking out company. Disturbing as it was, the forgotten highways are littered with oddities, and so I pressed on. Now, background on me. I'm an Oregon native, a blue-collar fellow with a healthy dose of skepticism. Speculation about ghost trucks or highway phantoms never rattled me. Such talk was entertainment, not gospel. But that morning ushered in an event so grounded in reality it made my skeptical blood run ice cold. Emerging from a thick fog bank just before dawn's light could scatter it, I spotted what appeared to be an abandoned vehicle on the roadside ahead. No hazard lights blinked their rhythmic cry for help, just stillness. Curiosity mingled with duty nudged at me and I slowed down. As a rule of thumb, you check on your fellow travelers when they're in need out here. It's humanity 101. The SUV was caked in mud but bore no license plates. Its angled position hinted at distress or haste. Details mattered little in comparison to its most disturbing feature. A splash of crimson streaked along its side as if hastily brushed by an invisible artist grimly devoted to macabre work. A chill danced along my spine, not from fear but the unmistakable sense that something insidious unfolded here. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped out into the heavy air, boots crunching underfoot as decades-old gravel proclaimed my approach long before I reached the vehicle's tinted windows. Peering inside revealed nothing but ebony shadows mocking my intrusion. Hello? Anyone there? My voice sounded smaller against nature's vast canvas. No reply came forth. Snapping a photo with my phone seemed prudent. Evidence for authorities should this be more sinister than it appeared. Looking about for track marks or discarded items yielded naught but silence and whispering pines. Suddenly, deafening snaps punctuated the quiet, a clear signal of human presence nearby. Driven by equal parts caution and concern for potential victims, I called out once more while thumbing off safety on my concealed peace. Protection is never paranoia when lives may hang in balance. A figure emerged then amidst trees embrace. A man draped in nondescript garments whose incredibly ordinary features seemed crafted to forget rather than remember. His gait was purposeful yet unhindered by weight or weariness. His hands bore scars akin to struggles past or craftsman's toll. His countenance said he belonged neither to civilization nor wilderness but dwelled betwixt their borders by choice or curse. We locked eyes and advanced no more words were exchanged. Mine were ready yet restrained. His were absent yet screaming tales untold across winter's harsh and summer's unforgiving. He held an object swaddled within grease-stained cloth a twisted sculpture wrought from obsidian desire that mirrored no known craftsmanship from local townsfolk. We stood there, breath hanging in the chill of the air. Neither of us moved. The man's eyes, sharp, piercing, held a depth of purpose. He took a step forward, unwrapping the grease-stained cloth to reveal more of the obsidian object. Its edges caught light, throwing shadows onto his face making him appear more gaunt, more desolate. I weighed my options rapidly. The situation felt like it could spiral out of control any second. 
I decided against calling for help. The location was remote and my call would likely go unheard. My priority shifted to defusing tension. His hand moved suddenly, sharply, hurling the object toward me. Instinctively I reached out, caught it. It was heavier than I anticipated, unbalanced and chilling to the touch. The man charged then, fists clenched, eyes wild with an anger that seemed rooted in deep suffering or desperate need. He swung hard and fast at my head. I ducked, felt air whoosh above me. His nails scratched my arm as he stumbled past. His body language spoke of a controlled rage honed by years of survival on margins where law seldom treaded. I backed away slowly, keeping eyes fixed on him but not engaging further. This was his attack. Fighting back didn't seem like an option that would end well for either of us. He snarled without sound and advanced again, swifter now as if letting loose all restraints he had mastered over time. The woods became an arena where every leaf crackled under our shifting weights. Suddenly there were sirens in the distance. Maybe some hiker had heard the commotion or glimpsed us during their trek. The man paused at the sound, as if tethered to an invisible line that urged caution over chaos. The sirens grew louder. He looked towards their source then back at me before turning away and plunging back into the thickets from whence he came. I stood alone now with heavy breaths and heart pounding hard against my chest ribs. In my hand was still that intense obsidian sculpture whose significance I couldn't begin to guess and whose origin felt as mysterious as the man who had given it to me through force. The authorities arrived soon after and searched the area but found nothing aside from disturbed earth and foliage from our scuffle. They took my statement with skepticism etched into their brows but wrote down every detail I gave them about the man, his ordinary yet unforgettable features and those haunting eyes. As days bled into nights then weeks, no one discovered who he was or why he carried such fury within him towards strangers or what that twisted sculpture symbolized in his solitary world between society and wilderness. In time, whispers about that day by the whispering pines died down, yet in my dreams sometimes he returned with those hands bearing scars of struggles reminiscent of more primal battles fought under cold moonlight or scorching sun without witness or judgment. And thus ended a brief encounter with a living enigma, a man without a name whose violence bore secrets I'd never uncover because some truths lie too deep within human souls for others to excavate without losing pieces of themselves along the way. Sometimes you just need a good burger to offset a week's worth of government-issued canteen food. That's precisely what I was thinking about as I left the Redwood Biotech Research Facility, nestled inconspicuously among the dense forest canopy of the Pacific Northwest. My name is Merrick Voorhees, and I'm not your typical lab coat. My work with genetic anomalies isn't something you'd find published in any science journal. The biting chill of the autumn air hinted at winter's approach as I reached my car. That's when I heard it, a crackling in the underbrush that didn't fit the usual melody of the woods. Rationality pinned it to an animal, maybe a deer, but isolation has a unique way of straining credulity. I'd scheduled to meet with Colton Piers and Alara Keen, uncommon names for even more uncommon people who shared my unusual vocation. Yet neither was answering their phone, leaving me wondering why their usual punctuality had faltered. Dropping my keys in frustration, I bent over to retrieve them and caught sight of something on the windscreen, a Lara's security badge smeared with what looked disturbingly like blood. Sirens aren't heard out here so my panicked mind raced over alternatives as I dialed our site director through clammy fingers. But when the phone only emitted continuous rings with no answer, 
reality twisted into something far grimmer than just a mishap. Voorhees, watch you doing just standing there. Looks like you've seen a ghost. It was Gavin Huxley, the facility janitor with timing as bad as his jokes. Forcing a grimace that must have resembled a smile, I nodded to him and turned my gaze back to the ominous forest where help wasn't coming. Something was out there, something potent enough to reduce my colleagues to silence and stir dread into my guts, and it was on me to uncover it. Stealing myself, gun secured in its holster, a precaution more ornamental than practical until today, I ventured toward our lookout tower situated deeper within the tree's embrace. The knackering climb elicited more sweat than usual. Maybe fear had joined gravity in its effort to pull me down. Atop the tower, binoculars in hand, I scoured through nature's camouflage for anything amiss when a half-guttural snapping noise spiked adrenaline levels to new highs. There was an upheaval in the foliage, a thrashing consistent with struggle or perhaps predatory satisfaction. Colton's voice crackled over my walkie, strained but unmistakable. Something, Northwest Section, need backup. Choking back a curse that would scald my grandmother's ears, I bolted down from my vantage, thoughts of potential burger joys bitterly surrendered to this unfolding nightmare. Through branches and undergrowth I crashed, each step hurtling me towards an uncertainty that Colton's tremors could scarcely elucidate. And then I saw it, or rather them, prints unlike any creature in scientific texts or hunter's lore, three-toed and unevenly spaced as if whatever made them limped on one side but still moved with hellspawn vigor. My firearm felt naive in hand. Yet who heads unarmed into fong and chloridled shadows? Merrick was sporadically punctuating his updates with increasingly gruesome discoveries. A strip of plaid shirt and snare down barbed wire. Definitely Colton's taste. Iodine whiffs marking where nature fought back. An unsettling crunch beneath footfall that no autumn leaf ever made. Guys? Gail from research piped nervously over calm. The Northeastern feed is offline. CCTV shouldn't just fail. Her words were choked off by staccato static reminding us that technology's vow is only as strong as its weakest circuit, or saboteur. Begrudgingly abandoning my search for overt signals, smoke plumes or glaring SOS patterns, I remembered Alara's fascination with cryptobotany plants engineered beyond mundane flora functions. Could answers lie within her green cloak sanctum? Merrick's voice crackled through the calm, urgency laced in his tone. It got Thompson. It's not human. We need to leave now. I ran, following the sound of Merrick's voice, my firearm a meager comfort. I didn't see what took Thompson, only the aftermath. Shreds of clothing, blood soaking into the earth, enough evidence of a violent struggle. We made it to Merrick. His face was pale, eyes wide with a terror that spoke volumes. Thompson was nowhere in sight. Only a trail of destruction led off into the dense forest. Gale's voice trembled through the calm. I have partial visuals back up. Movement. Fast to your east. We didn't hesitate, moving west as quickly as we could. None dared to speak of what might be pursuing us or what fate befell Thompson. Hours felt like days until we broke past the tree lean and into the clearing where we parked our vehicles. We piled in. Merrick drove, pushing the vehicle fast over rough terrain. Why aren't we calling for help? I managed to ask between jolts and jarring movements. Signals jammed, Merrick replied tersely. Started when we lost CCTV. We hit paved road. Civilization never seemed more inviting. The nearest town was an hour away. We drove in silence but for Gale's occasional attempts to reach out on the radio. We reached town and headed straight for the local sheriff's office. Pictures were taken, 
Our statements given albeit with withholding certain details for fear of disbelief and ridicule. An investigation followed. The outcome loomed inconclusively over us for days until I felt compelled to revisit the site despite my earlier reservations. I arrived at dawn only to find officials cordoning off the area. A federal team had been called in. Men and women in hazardous material suits treaded where we once did. In place of answers were now only questions and red tape. Return I did to my life with a heaviness a resolve not to venture back into the wilderness, where explanations were scarce and survival uncertain. Weeks passed. News channels hinted at an animal attack, but nothing conclusive came forth. Remembered I did those prints, the uneven gait, and shuddered at what creature could produce such marks without being recognized by current science or local knowledge. Merrick resigned from his position. Gale took a leave of absence for stress management. Our group disbanded without official closure. The treacherous experience bound each survivor with unspoken truths and unwelcome memories. Least forgotten being Thompson whom we paid homage with solemn reunions recounting his fervor for adventure that led him into darkness too profound. In end, our tale remains untold a lingering whisper among many lost within wilds untamed and creatures unknown. There's a certain silence in the woods that's deeper than anywhere else, a quietude so profound it feels like you're the only person left in the world. For Rustlin Hutchins... That was both his workplace and his personal haven, until one grim discovery turned it all to chaos. Rustlin, a recluse by nature, worked for the U.S. government in a hidden facility deep in the forests of Washington State, dabbling in genetic experiments that few outside his team could grasp. A fresh blanket of snow had established its jurisdiction over the landscape when Rustlin arrived that morning. Nothing but miles of pines and the crisp air that stung his lungs as he trudged towards his laboratory lodge. If you had told me ten years ago that I'd be playing mad scientist in this snow globe, I would have laughed. He told Border Collie Reeves, who was more interested in chasing squirrels than having existential conversations. His colleague, Casper Leary with peculiar interest in entomology beyond what the job called for, greeted him at the door with a nervous twitch in his eye. You gotta see this, Casper muttered, abandoning his usual scientific banter for solemnity. They walked past gleaming equipment and computer screens with scrolling genomes to an isolated chamber at the facility's heart. Inside, beneath harsh artificial light, lay a wild boar, or what was left of it. The creature had been eviscerated, flesh torn from bone with such raw ferocity it belied any tools or human methods Rustlin knew of. Found it just beyond the western ridge, Casper said, swallowing hard. Never seen anything like this before. The boar incident wasn't isolated for long. Reports among the staff grew of strange noises and eerie shadows flitting between trees after dusk, a stark contrast to their typical scientific discussions on genetics and mutations. And then came Lysandra Clement, a forestry specialist whose fascination with ancient tree species often left her oblivious to darker realities. Something's stalking us. She announced bluntly one overcast afternoon as she burst into Rustlin's office carrying spore samples, a break from her normal composed demeanor. Rustlin half smiled at her choice of words. Stalking? Come on, Lissy, what next? Bigfoot making rounds? A joke intended to lighten the mood fell flat as she fixed him with a steely gaze. No joke, she said firmly. I've tracked animals all my life. Nothing moves like this. A growing sense of unease took root among them as whispers populated the corridors, 
whispers Ruslan tried to dismiss with logic and reason. Amidst discussions of chromosomal anomalies and transgenic experiments, an unspoken question hovered. Had their work twisted some thread of nature into malevolent motion? By midpoint through one particularly tense week, the exact day forgotten, they decided to organize a sweep through specified forest sectors. Armed with weapons they never thought they'd need and radios crackling static communication between them, they weren't hunters but felt every bit prey themselves as they combed through an increasingly treacherous wilderness. It began subtly, an extra set of tracks accompanying those of deer or coyote, brush disturbed not by falling branches but something agile, and large, making deliberate passage through undergrowth. Distinctive thuds rumbled forward just as dusk began painting shadows longer across their paths. The radios buzzed. Hutchins! You see anything? It was Leary's voice pierced by panic. Ruslan forced himself forward into opacifying darkness while clutching his rifle like solace, every step heightening his skepticism metamorphosing into something akin to fear. He whispered back into his radio softly not betraying any hint of swirling emotions. Nothing yet. But then reality shattered as something massive shifted just beyond his flashlight beam a figure obscured but massive, its contours unfamiliar but bearing semblances of folklore terrors woven into children's bedtime stories, a silent stalker formed from nightmares but distinctly there and undeniably real. It didn't speak or cry out, it merely waited as if aware time played in its favor while human hearts pounded terror's rhythm against rib cages born frail compared to whatever brawn it possessed. I gripped my radio, my breath shallow. Hutchins, do you copy? I tried to control the tremble in my voice. No response. The brush cracked again, closer this time. I aimed my flashlight, illuminating two glowing eyes staring back at me. The creature that emerged was unlike any known fauna. It was bear-like but stood on two legs, muscular and towering. Leary! I hissed into the radio. It's not a bear. The creature charged without warning, immense and furious. Its claws were like daggers and its movements were swift, too swift for such a large body. It lunged at Hutchins who had appeared from behind a tree, ineffectually raising his arms in defense. The sounds that followed, the tearing of fabric, then flesh— ensured I'd never forget Hutchins' demise. Why didn't I call for help? Because deep down, I knew nothing around would match this brute force. Immediate action was required. Every moment spent calling for aid meant another life possibly lost. I sprinted towards the ranger station, evading the thick underbrush with survival overpowering rationale. My only thoughts were to secure the area and prevent further tragedy. Arriving breathless at the station, I radioed for assistance. Within minutes paramedics and additional rangers were en route. When they found Hutchins, or what remained, it was clear that the brute's attack left no chance of survival. The injuries were severe. Unforgiving gashes marked what used to be a face and torso. We later learned that similar incidents occurred nearby, vilified attacks from an unknown predator matching our encounter descriptions. In just a few days after the attack, authorities secured the zone and launched efforts to track this violent beast, though no clear evidence of its exact species was conclusive. We remembered Hutchins not only as a collie but as a victim of something brutally primal yet vaguely sentient in its calculated assault, something unrecorded by modern science yet terrifyingly real in consequence. I woke up early this morning, feeling restless. My name's Marvin Lassiter, a local hunter in the Stroudsbury Forest located in Arizona. 
I decided to venture out into the woods to see if I could bring home some game for dinner. My wife hates when I go hunting but honestly, it's the only place where I can finally find some peace and quiet. As I walked deeper into the forest, it was eerily calm. Birds were singing in the trees, and the sun was starting to paint beautiful shades of gold on the trunks of the tall pines around me. Despite its coming presence, there was always something unsettling about these woods. From the corner of my eye, I noticed the disturbing pattern of scratches on a nearby tree. It seemed as if an animal had viciously clawed at it not something you'd usually see around these parts. Startled by my own discovery, I heard crashing branches close by and quickly readied my rifle. I called out loudly, Who's there? Identify yourself. To my surprise, a woman emerged from behind a bush, her sobs turning to gasps as she tried to speak. A creature, it took my son. She choked. It felt like someone had punched me in the gut hearing those words. But I maintained my skeptical approach. All right, ma'am, I said with restraint. Let's just try and find him. We searched for her child cautiously. Suddenly we stumbled upon something even more confounding. What looked like an entire human ribcage lay bare on the ground among the fallen leaves. What? What could have done that? she whispered. At that moment, we both grew wary and no jokes would help ease this tension. As we ventured further into the wilderness something enormous darted past us at alarming speed in our peripheral vision it appeared to be humanoid but with limbs twisted unnaturally. Its pale skin looked both smooth and rough at the same time, a horrifying paradox. I realized that we weren't dealing with an animal. We followed the creature's path to where it had apparently emerged from the shadows of the forest into a small, enclosed clearing. As we stood there, completely overwhelmed by fear and curiosity, it became clear that we were about to face our worst nightmare. Closer now, I realized that the creature's chest was covered in different sized patches of fur and skin, as if it had been stitched together from multiple victims. Its eyes dark black voids that seemed to pierce into my very soul. The horrific creature glared at us as it let out an inhuman screech, daring us to approach. I aimed my rifle at the abomination but something told me bullets couldn't stop this monster. Whatever it was came from a place guns couldn't touch. I looked at the woman beside me and whispered, We need to warn others. We cannot face this thing alone. We retreated cautiously from the clearing, not taking our eyes off the horrifying creature. As we made our way back to civilization, we remained tense and alert, as if expecting the monster to leap out at us with every rustle of leaves. Once we finally reached the safety of her home, we barricaded the door and tried to make sense of what had just happened. Suddenly, I remembered I had a friend who was an expert in biology and zoology. I pulled out my phone and called him immediately. His name was Tom, and he responded groggily, confused by my panic tone. Tom, listen to me, I stammered. We just encountered some kind of monster. It's like a patchwork of human and animal parts and extremely fast. We're terrified, please. Do you have any idea what it could be? Christ, Tom muttered. It's hard to say without seeing it myself, but whatever it is, it doesn't sound natural. What can we do? I asked desperately. The only thing that comes to mind is calling the police, he suggested. You need professional help with this. We thanked Tom for his advice and hastily dialed the police, briefing them on our harrowing encounter. They assured us help would arrive soon but urged us to stay indoors in the meantime. Frantic minutes turned into hours as we stared out the windows, searching for any signs of the creature lurking outside the house. 
The anxiety churned in our stomachs until we finally saw police cars rolling into our driveway. Relief flooded through us as officers knocked on our door and entered cautiously. We recounted our terrifying experience once more this time to skeptical expressions. Sounds too far-fetched. One officer concluded dismissively. This isn't a joke, she said sharply, voice trembling with fear. My child is missing. This thing killed someone. Unable to provide any solid evidence, even the ribcage we discovered had vanished when they retraced our steps. They searched her child's room without finding any additional traces of foul play. Our hands seemed helplessly tied. But events escalated, and the police couldn't ignore it any longer. More reports came in of unresolved disappearances, and gruesome remains found scattered in the woods. The city grew speechless with mounting fear we found ourselves thrust into the center of a nightmare that refused to end. A task force was quickly assembled to get to the bottom of this bizarre case. They patrolled aimlessly in search of answers and the creature's supposed lair. It seemed like fighting an enemy that existed only in shadows, striking at will and leaving more victims in its wake. As days turned into weeks, News trickled in from the task force about a terrified man they found hiding in his basement, babbling about being hunted by the same creature we described. With two credible witnesses now validating our claims, the task force amped up its efforts. A tense evening brought an urgent call from Tom. He had heard rumors of a deranged scientist conducting horrifying, illegal genetic experiments deep within the forests surrounding our city. You remember what I said about it not sounding natural? He said breathlessly. I think somebody made this thing. The police raided the suspected location and stumbled upon a hidden laboratory filled with monstrous creations like the one we had encountered. Human-animal hybrids trapped within cages or suspended in fluid-filled containers. They apprehended the scientists responsible for these monstrosities and shut down his laboratory before he could unleash any more horrors upon us. In their search, they discovered scattered clothing remnants one piece bore resemblance to what her child had worn on that fateful day. Although no closure was granted for her missing child or other victims engulfed by this man-made terror, Knowing that our nightmare had come to an end offered a small sense of comfort. The city slowly returned to its previous state, but bore the burden of loss. Memorials were held for the victims, eulogized as brave souls who faced unspeakable torment at the hands of a monster human, or otherwise. In the aftermath of this grisly ordeal, We'll always remember those lost to this abomination and be haunted by the grim reminder that sometimes the monsters aren't just outside, but within us as well. I walked into the small diner in Cachiti Pueblo, New Mexico, feeling the weight of another difficult day at work. My name is Luca Tsosi, and I'm a local ranger around these parts. As the only Native American among my colleagues, I take pride in keeping our land safe and clean. Our usual table? asked my best friend Peter Ulibari, with a warm smile. Yeah, I nodded, sharing a first-hand account of how someone had vandalized the ancient petroglyphs. They asked me to lead an investigation to help catch those responsible. Peter listened intently and sympathized. As our conversation continued, an old man by the corner caught my attention. He had sandy gray hair that grew long down his back, a worn leather jacket, and eyes, like he had seen something terrifying. He lived alone and people knew little about Roy Gutierrez. He had never married nor had any children. His expression turned stern as he approached us. Luca, he whispered, glancing nervously around him. I need your help. Concerned by Roy's appearance and demeanor, 
I agreed to follow him outside to hear him out. We ventured into the chilly night air and wrapped our coats tighter around ourselves. Just past sundown earlier this week, he began trembling with fear as he spoke. My dog, Mingus, she ran away while on a walk around the reservation woods. I could see his struggle to continue as if what happened next was crushing him. I heard her bark ferociously before, before all went silent. The words escaped Roy in quivering spurts. When I finally found her, all that was left were pieces strewn about, teeth marks. What could do that? I asked softly, bracing myself for the answer. Roy responded with his voice barely above a whisper. It wasn't an animal we know. It had large piercing green eyes, almost human-like. It was massive, like a monster. He cautiously looked side to side before taking out an old photo from his wallet. He pointed at the creature that resembled a large wolf but ferociously mutated. I saw this brute last night, lurking in the shadows. The same beast killed my Mingus, I'm sure of it. Overwhelmed by everything Roy had just revealed, I promised to help find whatever it was responsible for the gruesome death of his dog. Just as we finished talking, distressing news broke out. Two murmurs had taken place near the reservation woods. One victim had been Denise Valdez, Roy's niece. Aye! Denise! Roy sobbed upon hearing the name. Swiftly making a solemn decision those responsible for vandalizing sacred symbols would have to wait. Justice was needed in response to more pressing horrors. Searching for clues to trace back to the unknown creature, and these brutal attacks begins with discussing with Peter. He tells me he will follow me on this ordeal. Together, along with Roy at the lead, we ventured into our target area, the reservation woods. As we began our descent into the reservation woods, the atmosphere was tense. Each of us knew the risk we were taking, searching for this deadly creature. However, our determination to find it was only fueled by the news of Denise's death. Roy led the way, his determination evident in his gait. Hours passed as we trekked deeper into the woods, following any signs that could lead us to this mysterious creature's hideout. Finally, we came across a cave entrance concealed by vegetation. Nervously, we approached. The smell emanating from within immediately hit me, a pungent odor suggesting decay and death. We hesitated at the entrance, none of us willing to venture inside first. I suggested that we call for help as this might be too dangerous for just us to handle. Roy argued that by the time help arrived, the creature might be gone, and it would bring even more bloodshed. Peter agreed with him, and with no other alternatives, we continued cautiously into the cave. The darkness inside was suffocating so we relied on our flashlights to illuminate our surroundings. Inching forward, our senses were consumed by fear as we navigated this descent into madness. A sudden noise from behind caught our attention, and we turned sharply to see something darting swiftly through the dark shadows of the cave's opening. Blood smeared on its fur guided our eyes towards its face. Those piercing green eyes locked onto ours. The massive beast resembled a wolf but with grotesque mutations— elongated limbs and distorted features, unlike anything I had ever seen. Before any of us could react or process what we were witnessing, it struck suddenly and brutally. Peter barely got out a scream before he went down, suffering multiple deep gashes from its sharp claws across his body. Unsure of what to do next and driven purely by instincts, Roy pulled me back towards the entrance of the cave while the creature mauled Peter. We didn't have time to help him or even think about fighting back. Our new priority was escaping with our lives. As we stumbled back out of the cave, I saw out of the corner of my eye a second beast emerging from the darkness. It stared at us, 
deciding whether to pursue or let us flee. Roy must have noticed as well and grabbed a branch on the way out, setting it ablaze with his lighter to deter any pursuit. We ran as fast as our legs would carry us, terrified of what might be behind us. The entire trek back was filled with panic-induced thoughts and suppressed sobs given everything that had happened that night. When we finally made it to the safety of our homes, adrenaline gave way to exhaustion and reality began setting in. Peter's lifeless body would never leave those woods. Determined to make sure no one else fell victim to those monstrous creatures, we decided it was time to alert law enforcement. They conducted their investigation but found no trace of any such beast. The lack of evidence frustrated us and left us questioning whether they believed our story at all. The officials deemed Peter's death a freak animal attack, but deep down, we knew better. As the days went by without incident, we attempted returning to our daily lives while honoring Peter's memory in our hearts. At least now, people knew the dangers lurking in those woods. The creature forever remains unexplained as a part of this gruesome tale. What it truly is remains a well-guarded secret within the depths of those dark woods. All I am left with are memories of innocent lives lost and questions endless in my mind. What spawned such creatures? Are there more out there? Will one day their true nature be revealed? For now, though, life goes on and we face each new day with caution knowing that somewhere close by lies a terror beyond anything we can understand or explain. This happened to me about a decade ago. I was visiting a remote cabin in the dense forests of Alaska, far from civilization. My name is Cassius O'Connell, and I'm a journalist by trade, always seeking unique stories. The off-the-grid location sat on the banks of a narrow stream, surrounded by towering evergreens. Nature was its only neighbor, bringing stillness and solitude to my days here. As I sat on the porch, hummingbirds fluttered by and squirrels dashed through the bushes. One day, I met locals Claudius and Elspeth Vanek who told me about recent unnerving events. They mentioned some folks went missing while backpacking in these woods not too long ago. Nobody knew what happened, but something strange was going on. I decided to investigate further. The three of us searched the woods together hoping to find any clues or evidence. Our steps were cautious, though they sounded like thunder as we broke the silence that shrouded this place. Be careful, Claudius whispered as we navigated a thorny patch. His eyes darted around the dense foliage. As we continued our search, we found an old campsite, abandoned and disheveled with torn tents and scattered belongings. A haunting chill ran down my spine as I imagined the terror that came to claim those unsuspecting hikers. Elspeth picked up a muddy pair of glasses from the ground. Wonder what happened here, she murmured. After hours of searching with nothing more than eerie echoes for company, we decided to call it a day. As night fell upon us and our flashlight beams carved paths through the darkness, we felt vulnerable no technology could save us from whatever lurked in these twisted shadows. As days passed and our investigation evolved, we found unnerving clues, blood-soaked clothing hidden beneath tree roots, scratched messages etched into trunks crying for help. The plot thickened, with each tidbit feeding our curiosity and fear in equal measure. One afternoon, while Claudius rested against a tree, Cracking jokes to ease the tension, I heard Elspeth gasp and point to the distance. Squinting my eyes, I could barely make out a large, hulking figure deep within the shadows. My heart thundered within my chest as it moved closer. It was unlike anything I had ever seen, an enormous creature with an animal's head, long sinewy limbs, 
and massive gnarled claws, frighteningly unnatural yet reminiscent of familiar animals. We hid behind a decaying log, watching it skulk through the trees with predatory fluidity. Its movements were silent despite its size, its intense gaze seemingly oblivious to our presence. I could hear Claudius and Elspeth's labored breathing as we clutched each other for support, daring not to breathe too loudly for fear of alerting the monstrosity. The creature stopped suddenly near a bush, where it stooped down and snatched a small rabbit hiding beneath the leaves. It tore into its prey mercilessly right before our horrified eyes as we fought to hold back our gasps of terror. After devouring its meal, it inexplicably turned toward us, its gaze paralyzing us with primal fear. It took a deliberate step forward as if preparing to pounce when Elspeth's shaking hands slipped from mine, giving us away. The creature's ears twitched at the subtle sound and its dark eyes locked onto ours, instantly discovering our hiding place. The world around us fell silent except for one thing, our pounding hearts threatening to burst within our chests. In a sudden rush of panic, we scrambled to our feet and took off running through the woods, desperately hoping to escape the creature's notice. Claudius led the way, navigating us through the thick undergrowth as quickly as possible. Elspeth trailed behind me. I could hear her footsteps growing heavier with each passing moment. As adrenaline coursed through my veins, I couldn't shake the image of the creature's gruesome feast from my mind. The air vibrated with the tension as our breaths and footsteps echoed through the otherwise silent forest. We didn't dare to look back, afraid that one glance would be all it took for the creature to catch us. Racing forward, Claudius suddenly slowed his pace and signaled for us to stop. Look, he whispered pointing toward a cabin in the clearing ahead. We can hide in there. Despite our desperate circumstances, we hesitated for a moment before bolting toward our only chance for refuge. Upon crossing the threshold into the dim cabin, we found ourselves in an abandoned yet surprisingly intact living space. Terrified that windows and doors would be insufficient protection against a monstrous predator, we dragged furniture over entrances to barricade ourselves inside. As we huddled together in the corner waiting for any sign of danger, Elspeth suddenly spoke in a trembling voice. What was that thing? It looked like some kind of shapeshifter or skinwalker. Claudius shook his head slowly, replying somberly. I don't know much about folklore or creatures like that but whatever that monstrosity was seen beyond anything found in superstition. My stomach churned at their words, both cold comfort as it reminded us that no one would readily believe our story if we managed to make it out alive. The hours crept by slowly intense silence as we listened to any indications of movement outside the cabin. When darkness fell, an eerie stillness gripped the already tense atmosphere. Suddenly, our fragile silence was shattered by the sound of heavy footsteps outside the cabin. We exchanged terrified glances as we heard the external barricades being ripped apart by whatever monstrous force hid within the shadows. Our hearts thumped with wild beats as we prepared for the worst. Claudius grabbed a hunting knife from a nearby shelf, gripping it with white-knuckled determination. He whispered to us, Stay here. If I don't make it back, get help. Before we could protest, Claudius crept out of our hiding spot to face the creature head on. Elspeth and I clung to each other in fear, our breaths shallow and frantic. Moments later, we heard a horrifying screech followed by Claudius's gut-wrenching scream. Tears streaming down our faces, Elspeth and I made an unspoken agreement. We would not wait any longer for help we had to escape. Slipping through the forest under cover of darkness, we hoped against hope that whatever fate befell Claudius would grant us time to reach safety. Our thoughts were consumed by guilt and fear. Still, we refused to let his sacrifice be in vain. 
The distant lights of a nearby village became visible through the trees, providing our exhausted minds a sliver of hope. With that sight guiding us forward, we found ourselves stumbling into safety with newfound determination. The village locals were understandably skeptical of our tale. Nevertheless, they offered sympathy as they treated the scrapes and bruises obtained during our harrowing ordeal. In mourning for Claudius and unable to shake the haunting images of that night from memory, Elspeth and I shared an unbreakable bond forged in terror and grief. With a sorrowful nod between us on one final morning in the village, we set out together on a mission to reveal the truth of the monstrous creature that stalked the woods, hoping to prevent its reign of bloodshed from claiming more innocent lives. This happened to me a few years back at the isolated outpost cabin in Alaska. My name is Amias Oakenforth, a recently divorced man looking for solitude. I went there with my two friends, Otis Brixley and Zeno Kincaid, who insisted on making this trip a healing experience for me. We loved the cabin's picture-perfect location, set deep within the sprawling woods. The lush forest surrounding us invited exploration. One day, as we hiked along the riverbank just beyond our cabin, we found a seemingly abandoned campsite with torn tents and bloodstains on the ground. My friends and I exchanged worried glances before Otis cracked a joke, just typical of him in tense situations. No need to Sherlock around here. Place looks like a bear had too much tequila, Otis proposed. We concurred and continued hiking but remained extra vigilant during our outdoor escapades. Things settled relatively quickly until our fourth night when we heard something marauding outside the cabin. There it is again, whispered Zeno, nervously glancing at his shotgun leaning against the wall. Remnants of previous meals were laid out on the outdoor table like an invitation for an unwanted guest. We decided to wake up early to assess any damage done and call park rangers if necessary. Our morning investigation revealed peculiarly large claw marks around our food supplies. Otis concluded it was from an unusually hungry beast and that we should fathomably protect ourselves further. Immediately following this revelation, Zeno's shotgun took center stage in our secluded lives. A few days later, Hiking far away from our initial find, my foot brushed against an unnervingly rough patch of dirt amid mossy undergrowth. I called Otis and Zeno over before brushing more leaves away to unveil another chilling scene. Crumpled tents littered among branches torn violently from trees surrounding the area. A bear on tequila wouldn't stand a chance against this mess. Otis quipped, but we all shared the same frightened look in our eyes. It wasn't long before our dread manifested itself into an unmistakable, malicious presence lurking in the shadows. Its intent couldn't be fathomed, but it would appear in the corners of our eyes, vanish abruptly each time Zeno lifted his shotgun. My friends began questioning my sanity as I started feeling watched during our hiking excursions. I finally had a chance to confront the lurking figure before me on a solo hike further into the woods. Out of nowhere, an unexpected force bowled me over and pinned me to the ground. Staring back at me were red orbs glowing above a grisly, hideous face, something far worse than my wildest nightmares. This creature bore immense weight along its muscular frame with coarse hair matted onto discolored skin scarred by untold battles. It bared gnashing fangs within its twisted maw and released a guttural growl. I remained motionless as it loomed above me. The deep scratches across its chest suddenly began to flay open. The creature threw back its head and roared in agony before bounding away into the dark wilderness. I scrambled back to my feet taking off towards the cabin while gasping for breath. Otis and Zeno were waiting there, 
Their eyes widened with disbelief as they listened to my frenetic account. Amy is, this doesn't make any sense. No creature like that exists in Alaska, or anywhere. Zeno protested, gripping his shotgun tighter while pacing the room. Dissatisfied with lack of background noise in the tense cabin, Otis shouted for assistance and waved desperately at his phone that barely received any signals due to our spatial separation from civilization. As we sat waiting for help that might never come, our jittery bundle of nerves were offset by various attempts at humor. Otis suggested one last hike to search for signs of escaping campers that could have survived. Just as we geared up and stepped out, a plume of fog rolled in, drowning our surroundings in the gloomy haze. Otis led the way, intricately trekking ahead while making sure his friends followed closely behind. Suddenly, an ear-splitting howl pierced the air, and rage roars followed swiftly as a monstrous creature swiped at Otis with furious accuracy. The creature's razor-sharp claws lashed at Otis, tearing into his flesh as he screamed in pain. Zeno and I tried to reach him, but the fog seemed to be getting denser, disorienting us. The demonic roars of the monstrous beast echoed around us, preventing us from discerning the direction from which they were coming. In a frantic rush, we eventually found Otis. His shredded body sprawled on the ground, seeping blood all around. Zeno clasped his hands together and called for help once more while I desperately attempted to stanch the flow of blood from Otis' grievous wounds. Zeno received a response on his phone the screen flickering with an indication that someone received our message for assistance. We knew that we would have to hold out until help arrived. Time became a blur as we tried our best to keep Otis alive and ourselves safe. The thunderous footsteps of the beast reverberated all around us, taunting us with its presence while remaining just out of sight. Strange guttural noises filled the air making it difficult for us to communicate or pinpoint where it was hiding. Just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, Zeno dropped his shotgun while fending off an unseen attacker. We watched in horror as it fell into a chasm that had appeared before us an eerie abyss belching forth fog. We were left weaponless and vulnerable to this mysterious creature's wrath. When hope seemed lost, Headlights approached in the distance through the mist. A vehicle screeched to a halt, too late for Otis but just in time for Zeno and me. We were pulled into the safety of its metal confines while professional hunters armed with rifles fanned out into the darkness. As we drove away from the horrifying scene with emotions in turmoil, chaos ensued between reality and what we had just experienced. The idea of a shapeshifter came crashing down on me like a ton of bricks. I shuddered at the thought, struggling to rationalize the events. Zeno and I spent days recounting our ordeal in hopes of finding a semblance of clarity. We were both aware that we could never truly comprehend what happened those few days in Alaska. Was it a legendary skinwalker, or something else that lurked in the woodlands? Could it have been a malformed bear or wolf? Weeks later, as we tried to adjust to our new reality and mourn the loss of Otis, I received an unexpected package. Inside was a note written in hurried handwriting. Found near your campsite. Study and learn next time you might not be so lucky. Beneath the note was a book about ancient creatures and myths. Flipping through its old pages... I found sketches that resembled our antagonistic predator and descriptions that matched its ferocious nature. My newfound knowledge couldn't save Otis or change the past, but it fueled my resolve to understand the nightmare that haunted us and prevent it from harming others. I stared at the package on my doorstep, perplexed. The surprise parcel had no return address, and I didn't remember ordering anything online. 
My name is Carter Wilkins, just an average guy who works as a graphic designer. I stepped into my house and carefully sliced through the tape with a knife. Inside I found what appeared to be a hand-drawn map with X's marked in different spots. My curiosity peaked. The map illustrated a small town not far from mine called Ashbrook. Before moving here, I had lived through some tough times. Like many, I was just trying to make ends meet. Ashbrook seemed like the perfect escape from reality. Intrigued, I drove to the town using the map as my guide. Once there, I started at the first marked spot which led to an abandoned house with broken windows and doors hanging off their hinges. I've been waiting for you, called out an elderly woman from behind me. Her name was Hazel Davis. She offered to be my guide through Ashbrook. Following her lead, we ventured into the heart of the town while she shared its history and some local gossip. As we continued along our way, we encountered several peculiar incidents. A headless bird statue in a park, red graffiti sprayed on walls, all marked X's on my map. The last location on my map led us to a dimly lit warehouse situated close to Ashbrook's border. We cautiously moved inside only to find it empty, save for chains and scattered bones across the floor. Growing anxious, Hazel whispered that there were rumors about a dangerous creature lurking around these parts, an enormous humanoid wolf with razor-sharp teeth and claws so powerful that they could rip apart flesh like paper. We tried calling for help. However, our phones had no signal in this isolated warehouse. In retrospect, it may have been wiser to inform someone about our venture into an unknown location. Moments later, I heard a gut-wrenching growl echoing through the warehouse. My heart raced as we tried to flee. It was too late. Like an eerie shadow, the massive creature lurched from the darkness, its gnarled snout glistening with saliva. I never thought I'd come face to face with such a horrifying beast or that it would lead to my encounter with Bill Thompson— a police officer who later went missing under suspicious circumstances. As we scrambled toward the exit, Hazel tripped over a chain, and when I turned back, I saw the creature closing in on her. Its grotesque maw expanded as it prepared to sink its teeth into her frail body. What are you waiting for? Go! Hazel screeched, writhing in pain as she tried to push herself up. Despite her insistence, I hesitated. How could I leave her behind? Not far away lay a rusted pipe, grabbing it off the ground. I mustered every ounce of courage and swung it at the creature's skull. Momentarily stunned and disoriented, it reeled back from Hazel's grasp. We limped toward the door, gasping for breath, almost out of reach of the beast that lurked within that dreaded warehouse. Suddenly, Gunshots rang through the air, a few missed shots before one hit its mark, burying into the monstrous wolf's fur. A local cop had grasped his firearm in desperation and was now firing away in our defense. The officer, now identified by his name tag as Bill Thompson, pumped a few more rounds into the brute, each resounding impact causing it to stagger. The beast appeared injured, but not for long. Its hulking form began shaking violently as if rapidly healing itself. It turned its piercing yellow eyes towards us before taking off on all fours, disappearing from our line of sight. Officer Thompson rushed over to assist Hazel and me. Out of breath and fear-stricken, we exchanged quick glances at one another. Don't you two have cell phones? Why didn't you call for help? he asked urgently, panting. My own phone had fallen out of my pocket during the altercation leaving me with no means to call for help, while Hazel's screen had been shattered during her fall earlier. Having no time to dwell on it longer, Officer Thompson helped us into his squad car and called for backup over the radio. As we waited for their arrival, 
I found myself unable to shake the image of that terrifying creature did it look like a werewolf. Such a notion seemed absurd since werewolves were creatures of folklore. But how else could one explain its half-human, half-wolf appearance? As additional officers arrived on scene, they cautiously approached the warehouse with their weapons drawn. Moments later, anguished cries erupted from the building, followed by frantic shouts for backup and orders demanding retreat. All at once, it became clear that even law enforcement stood no chance against this anomaly. The ground shook as the monstrous creature charged out of the warehouse once more. Police bullets flew but failed to make any noticeable impact if anything. They seemed only to enrage the beast further. It charged at a nearby officer and slammed him into the pavement with enough force that he remained quite still afterward lifeless. People screamed in horror as they scrambled for cover. What do we do now? panicked Officer Thompson, his voice trembling. None of us had a clue. Desperate, I found myself attempting to stutter out an idea. W. We have to distract it. Lead it away from everyone. A fellow officer nodded in grim agreement, aware that any plan was better than none. Using flares lit from their patrol cars, they hurled them at the creature hoping to catch its attention. The wolf-like behemoth growled and hissed as the flares landed near it momentarily disoriented. Taking advantage of this window of opportunity, the officers began shouting from a distance to draw the savage creature away from our location. It hesitated only for a moment before giving chase. Miraculously, the plan seemed to work for now beasts like these were bound to be sensitive to bright lights and loud noises. But what would happen once those distractions waned? Driven by its insatiable bloodlust, would it return for a second round? One fact remained evident. Even with our combined efforts, no one could hope to protect each other through conventional means. As Officer Thompson escorted Hazel and me back to safety, we attempted to process the events that had unfolded that night. Nothing could have prepared us for this situation nearly days ago. Everything was tranquil. Were we forever changed? Days later, we'd learned that Officer Thompson went missing under suspicious circumstances following our encounter with the beast. Despite search and rescue efforts conducted throughout the area, no sign of him was found, no body nor evidence of an attack. Yet one day as I walked by a dense patch of woods near town limits, amongst broken twigs littering the ground lay an uncanny object a nearly pristine police name tag that read Bill Thompson. An overwhelming sense of dread washed over me at that moment. The image of that sinister creature continued haunting me long after the incident, its ferocity leaving behind a legacy etched into my mind. A hulking, wolf-like monster that defied logic and explanation, wreaking havoc upon our once tranquil suburban life a sinister force indiscriminately targeting anyone in its path. But for all the dread I faced during this nightmare, I couldn't forget the heroism displayed by Officer Thompson. His bravery against an unparalleled adversary became something of legend amongst the locals, a testament to the human spirit in the face of unfathomable evil. I'm Ronald Flinch, an out-of-work detective from Muskegon, Michigan. After filing for bankruptcy, I found myself on a less-than-stellar journey to find peace. All that changed one afternoon when I stumbled across Winchester Grove, a forgotten town in the depths of America's heartland. Streets devoid of life greeted me as I wandered deeper into the eerie silence. My only company was the wind whispering through abandoned homes. The shadows played tricks on my eyes as I passed the dilapidated playground where rusted swings creaked away, without a child in sight. Drawn to the town's church, I stepped inside. The musty scent of decay filled my lungs. 
There were signs of a struggle, Askew pews and torn him books on the floor. I wonder what happened here, I whispered to myself. As night crept upon me, I set up camp in the church basement. Rummaging for supplies in a forgotten pantry, I overheard two unfamiliar voices above me, Frank Baxter and Melinda Ames. Clinging to the stairs, I heard them speculate about townsfolk disappearing because of a mysterious beast that stalked these abandoned grounds. My curiosity piqued. I approached Frank and Melinda, wanting answers about this ominous creature. Their accounts were different but had a common thread brutal attacks, massacre-like scenes with no survivors. That can't be true, I said skeptically. But it is, whispered Melinda. We've seen what it leaves behind. Their resolve was enough to send us out into the cold drizzle outside. We were armed and cautious our vulnerable flashlight beams our only guide through this forsaken landscape. Underscore. The air grew heavy as we approached the old butcher's shop near town's edge. Its red bricks worn by years of neglect and corrosion, shattered windows stared hollowly at approaching strangers like vacant eyes. Melinda gasped. The door swung open with a painful groan exposing a horrific scene. Mutilated limbs scattered, blood stains seeping into the floorboards. This was our first encounter with remnants of the creature's violence. I shuddered in disgust, while Frank tried to make sense of it. This is beyond any human capability, he concluded. As we hesitantly left, we heard an otherworldly howl echoing through the air an animalistic sound, yet distinctly unnatural. I was no longer as skeptical. We huddled close together and hurried in the opposite direction, towards the labyrinthian woods surrounding Winchester Grove. Our breaths grew heavy with anticipation as branch shadows reached like twisted fingers towards us. Suddenly, we spotted it. It surely matched the descriptions. A humanoid wolf creature with silver fur contrasting against obsidian eyes. Blood stained its maw as it sniffed at something unseen on the ground, its tattered clothes hanging from its muscular frame. Frank gripped his shotgun anxiously while Melinda's trembling hand clutched her pistol. It was time to confront this beast of nightmarish proportions and end its reign of terror. It's killed too many already, said Frank. Then we have to stop it, Melinda replied determinedly. The creature abruptly stopped its sniffing and looked up, seemingly in our direction with an intensity that suggested it was aware of our presence. We tensed, prepared for it to lunge at us. But it remained still, studying the area with a wary caution that sent shivers down my spine. Let's call for help, Melinda whispered urgently. I think we're in over our heads here, Frank agreed, pulling out his phone. There's no reception here. We'll have to find higher ground to make the call. We all realized how vulnerable we were in this situation. It was clear that the creature was far more dangerous than any of us could have ever anticipated. We began moving away slowly so as not to provoke it into attacking us. As we backed away, the creature suddenly and unexpectedly leaped towards a tree and scrambled into its branches with incredible speed. Though momentarily free from the direct line of sight, the horrifying prospect that it now could attack from above remained. We reached a small hill where Frank's phone showed one weak bar of reception just enough to place an emergency call. He dialed breathlessly. We need help at Winchester Grove immediately. We found the creature it's incredibly dangerous. Send reinforcements. The operator on the other end responded that help was on its way, though it would take at least fifteen minutes for them to arrive. We couldn't wait for them there in plain sight. The sun had almost set entirely by then, casting an even darker atmosphere over the forest. We retreated back into the trees to avoid detection while waiting for backup to reach us. 
Minutes felt like hours as we tightly gripped our weapons and listened intently for any sign of movement around us. Suddenly, a branch broke behind us, and before any of us could react, I felt something wrench my arm out of its socket. The excruciating pain was momentarily blinding, and I managed a brief glimpse of the creature's silver fur before it vanished back into the shadows with me held tight in its grip. I was unable to scream as the monster bit down onto my shoulder, warm blood flowing from the wound. The pain was unbearable, but by some miracle, it chose not to kill me, merely incapacitating me as I fell limply to the ground. Frank and Melinda managed to crawl towards my fallen form, their eyes wide with terror. They couldn't risk shooting at the creature even if it gave them an opportunity, knowing that they might hit me instead. The creature prowled further away, keeping a cautious distance while watching us with a sinister intelligence that belied its bestial appearance. The three of us remained trapped in this torturous standoff until we heard sirens approach from the distance. The creature glanced towards the source of the sound and seemed to calculate its odds. It swiped one long clawed paw into the air before disappearing back into the forest. Frank and Melinda rushed to my side just as help arrived, paramedics managing to stem blood flow from my injuries. Dazed and weak, I shivered on the ground as I gazed at where the creature had once stood. Despite our initial disbelief, we had just faced something beyond our understanding, something akin to a werewolf from stories we had once dismissed. Everyone in our town was now aware of its existence and danger, though how they could ever comprehend this terror remained uncertain. As for us, Frank, Melinda, and myself, we would never forget what had transpired that fateful day at Winchester Grove. Our lives forever changed by one encounter with a beast that defied rational thought. May we never cross paths with it again, and may those who walk these woods after us carry with them caution and vigilance, lest they too face something truly monstrous under such an otherwise innocuous moonlit sky. I remember the way the morning mist clung to the canopy in the national park where I work. Birdsong cut through the quiet like a whisper of nature's resilience. My name is Arlo Sutherland, and for years these woods have been my responsibility, my sanctuary. On days like this, I usually patrolled the trails, ensuring hikers stayed safe and followed park regulations. The tranquility shattered when I stumbled upon a campsite torn asunder, tents shredded, belongings scattered across the underbrush like leaves in a storm. Splotches of red smeared across fabric and tree alike painted a grisly scene unlike any wildlife attack I'd known. I radioed for help immediately, no response. The communication tower on the far ridge stood silent an ominous sentinel over my unanswered calls. Something within beat peculiarly. Interference? Sabotage? My gut tightened as I realized isolation had just become another encroaching threat. Not far from the wreckage, I discovered a trail of disturbed earth leading into the denser parts of the forest. Footprints. But not quite human. Large and misshapen, each step sunk deep into the soil with an unearthly weight. Whoever, or whatever made these was powerful and unfamiliar to both myself and any texts on local fauna. Edgar Fournier, my oldest friend and fellow ranger, was due for his shift, a couple hours overdue by then, and concern nodded inside me. He took risks often for that rush of adrenaline no climbing gear could match. Dread crept inward as I followed that trail. The day aged into a dimming glare filtered through thick branches above. This beast's track was winding me deeper into areas we never charted for public use. No markers here, just primal woods as they had been for centuries before us. Then I heard it, 
a rustle louder than any deer or bear forged ahead of me where bramble and thicket grew thick like castle walls. This pursuit wasn't just duty. It was personal now. My park, Edgar's safety, a fear that clenched my throat with every snapped twig underfoot. Armed with nothing more than my standard-issue sidearm and the hope Edgar was still out there to make some wise crack about my aim, I pushed onward. The creature finally appeared at twilight by a rocky creek bed, an abomination of nature's law, towering and grotesque with limbs that seemed to writhe independent from its hulking shadow body. Fangs protruded like tusks from a maw too large to be real. Its eyes caught mine amidst shifting shades, reflecting nothing human, merely gleaming orbs filled with predatory instinct. It had been so quiet till then, no guttural growls or otherworldly screams, a silent stalker specter among these ancient trees. I turned back, my mind racing with the need to seek safety and bring help for Edgar. As a ranger responsible for these woods and its visitors, retreat was strategy, not cowardice. With heavy breaths, I retraced the steps that had led me down this uncharted path. The creature didn't give chase. Perhaps, I thought, it was territorial and I was simply an intruder to be scared off. Reaching a familiar trail, I pulled out the radio often neglected on quiet days. Base, do you copy? This is Ranger Alex. Request immediate backup. Possible wild animal threat near the creek bed off the west boundary. Static then a response crackled through. Copy that, Alex. Is anyone hurt? Possible missing person, I said, trying to suppress the urgency in my voice. Send help. As dark settled in like a heavy shroud over the forest, two of my colleagues arrived, guns ready and eyes wide with apprehension. We approached the creek bed together. Their presence steeled me against the unknown. We found Edgar there by moonlight's grace. He was alive but shaken, wounds along his arms that looked nothing like any bear I'd known to roam our woods. We need to get him out. I said briskly as we fashioned a makeshift stretcher from branches and jackets. Later at the hospital, after doctors tended to his lacerations, Edgar described an encounter with a dark mass with eyes like coals. There were no words for it. No bears walked upright like men and no known animal had fangs that curved into twisted smiles. In days following... Rangers searched but found no sign of a creature like Edgar described. Tales circulated, a large bear or undiscovered species perhaps, logical efforts to explain the unexplainable. The park reopened with new warnings issued about dangerous wildlife potentially in uncharted areas. We couldn't just close down entire expanses based on one incident, despite feeling every shadow might hide unseen terrors. At night in sleep sedge between reality and dream, images of twisted limbs and gruesome fangs flashed behind closed eyelids before disappearing into darkness. Reminders nothing was guaranteed in these ancient woods. One thing remained certain. Those woods held secrets deeper than its roots that perhaps were meant to stay buried beneath layers of earth and time and Edgar's chuckle when finally glimpsing daylight still resonated clearer than any truth we could hope to uncover about what really lurked beyond those castle walls of thorns. Every morning, just like any other, I lace up my boots, grab my gear, and head out into the vast expanse of the Groveland Pines National Park. My name is Arlen Creedy, a park ranger tasked with protecting this slice of nature. This morning, I joked with my colleague Bethany Mars that the trees whispered more sense than most of our radio chatter. The sky painted a muted gray, and the scent of pine and earth saturated the air as I patrolled a typically deserted stretch. Off the beaten path, I stumbled upon a scene that churned my stomach, 
a circle of animals, not just dead but arranged in an unnatural pattern as if carefully placed by human hands. With raised eyebrows and a clenched jaw, I radioed Bethany for assistance. Bethany, gonna need you by the West Ridge. Looks like a poacher's idea of art. Her voice crackled through, laced with concern. On my way, ETA 15. While waiting, I swept the vicinity with guarded steps. From where they had been placed, it was clear no animal dragged them here. This was intentional. The act seemed fresh. No sign of decay or scavenger marks marred the corpses. Such cruel clarity prompted me to draw my sidearm. Regulations rarely called for it unless wildlife posed an immediate danger. Bethany arrived quietly, her usually light expression darkened by the scene before her. Our dialogue was sparse as we cordoned off the area and documented everything. After her departure to alert local law enforcement, silence reclaimed the forest. Hours later as dusk encroached and shadows crept along the forest floor, I caught motion in my periphery, a figure darting between trees too agile and silent for any known creature. Unease gripped me. Not all threats in these woods were four-legged or winged. I followed at a safe distance until I arrived at a clearing where moonlight revealed details not meant for sane recollection. A creature, if it could be called that, with disproportionate limbs and a gait that seemed to mock human motion gorge on what remained of an unfortunate hiker. Gripping my firearm, sweat chilling despite my haste, I aimed but did not fire. The situation defied explanation or logic. No report could shoulder these words. Mind racing yet expression schooled in cautionary calmness. The creature locked eyes with mine a sign acknowledged not by sound or gesture but by stillness, an immortal moment before it disappeared into the brush without a trace. A crunch underfoot spun me around. Bethany stood there now, wide-eyed at my weapon's drawn state and pale demeanor. We need backup. She urged me. What words could carry such madness? I nodded at Bethany's words. Right, back up. Let's go. I said. We left the clearing, heading towards where our signal could pierce the dense canopy. Back at our vehicle, I radioed for assistance with a quivering hand, giving them our coordinates. I kept details scarce, unsure how to articulate the night's events without sounding unhinged. Within minutes, blue and red lights sliced through darkness as squad cars pulled up. Their arrival brought uniformed figures crowding the forest edge with flashlights and questions. Bethany took the lead in explaining, saying we stumbled upon a crime scene with likely an animal attack. Her voice remained steady, eyes avoiding mine. When asked about the creature I witnessed, I remained silent. There was no logic in describing something that defied natural order, no reference point for this entity in any textbook or database. Officers fanned out while we confined at a distance. Together we listened to their communication crackle over radios until a shout broke the static. We rushed to see they'd found another figure amongst the trees, mauled beyond recognition. It wasn't until daylight that the full horror revealed itself. A trail of destruction led to multiple bodies, each marked with savage brutality. Search teams worked methodically through the forest while whispers hinted at a bear or large feline that grew bolder, hungrier by both animal instincts and opportunity. Days passed as experts combed every inch of terrain and documented each grim discovery. I assisted where needed but avoided the clearing from that first night, my memories replaying a scene no living being should endure. In end, no trace of the aberration surfaced, nor did any plausible explanation arise from soil and foliage samples. The silence among us grew heavy as local news lamented on lost lives. And all I could do was listen, 
my encounter seared into memory as an unspeakable chapter written not by pen but claw and tooth in the annals of an unforgiving wild. They called off the search eventually claiming a rare predatory event occurred with tragic outcomes. No pages marked any monster. Authorities concluded that nature sometimes deviates creating predators unclassified but deadly nonetheless. Closure never graced those devastated by loss or those haunted by sights and sounds belonging to night terrors alone. Yet life persisted. Survival dictated moving forward even when shadows held secrets too gruesome for light's truth. I returned to my duties marking boundaries and surveying land yet vigilance became my silent partner. I watched for movements not accounted for by wildlife known to science held my breath when wind carried unknown scents and reminded myself of reality's fragile facade when night enveloped everything around me. It was a typical morning when the unexpected shattered the mundane like a hammer through glass. My name's Elias Grove, just your average truck driver hauling cargo across states, mile after mile of open road my only constant companion. That day, I was set to make a delivery to a rural facility near Crater Lake in Oregon as isolated as you get without falling off the map. The scenery around here could steal your breath away with towering pines and sheer cliffs that plummeted into the bluest of waters. The first hint of something amiss was the delivery schedule it was off by several hours, something that gets you frowning in this line of work. Precision is the beating heart of logistics. But then I had prided myself on adaptability. Dispatch chalked it up to a system glitch and pushed my schedule back with a casualness that irked me more than it should have. With time to kill and nowhere in particular to go, I stopped by the nearby town of Klamath, a smudge on the map kept alive by those passing through and stubborn locals clinging to their ancestral homes. Cafes and antique stores huddled together, as if bracing against the encroaching wilds. Here I met two brothers, Dalton and Lau Mercer, who ran a filling station passed down from their great-grandfather. Young bucks with rough hands and smiles too easy for their years. They joked about city life and how their biggest crime was boredom, though I found that hard to believe in such isolation. Soon after midday, the brothers' humor turned practical as they helped me with directions. Keep an eye out for wildlife, Lyle said with a crooked grin. Bears love fresh fish, but they ain't picky when it comes to fresh tires. Chuckles were shared before well wishes saw me back on my route. The pristine wilderness around Crater Lake didn't prepare me for what awaited at the delivery point, an abandoned warehouse off an unmarked trail. Weathered by time or neglect, its exterior melded with the surrounding nature as if trying to disappear entirely. Unloading had barely begun when a dull thud from within ignited every nerve in my body. Caution demanded silence as I approached. Inching through the gaping entranceway, light struggled through broken rafters, painting shadows across debris littered floors where rodents had claimed squatters' rights. As I scouted further into that forgotten place, another sound arrested my breath, not an echo of wildlife but steel upon steel in an uneven rhythm. I called out, folly in hindsight but only silence replied with mocking stillness until footsteps answered not mine. They came unhurried but deliberate. Someone else was here. And then he appeared from behind rows of long-abandoned shelving units tall wearing jeans caked with dirt and evidence of laborious days without repentance. His shirt tail hung like an afterthought and stubble encroached upon features weathered by more than just sun. Our eyes locked. Either friendship nor warmth resided in his gaze. He marched toward me without words, his presence signifying intent rather than pleasantry. Distance closed between us as realization pressed upon me like gravity, 
There was no signal here for a desperate call for backup nor escape for this was his ground won over many peers' solitude, and he was alone. He walked steadily, carrying a crowbar with a grip that spoke of habitual use. The metal trailed, scrapping against concrete, the same uneven clatter I heard before. No words but his intent measured in each stride. I stepped back, certain violence would follow. There was no phone signal here, nothing but thick walls that muffled pleas for help. So I made a choice, to flee deeper into the labyrinth of rooms rather than scream into void air. He followed. Each step was a sound, taunting me further into darkness. Light became scarce. My eyes struggled to adjust while he seemed unbothered by the shift from day to dusk within these walls. A room approached, stacked with boxes and draped in years of neglect. I wedged myself behind the largest pile, holding my breath as his steps neared. Silence lingered then passed. He moved on. Minutes waned as I waited for an assurance of isolation. When courage mounted I emerged and sought a path marked by light, a probable exit. The exit came into view when the attack occurred. Agony exploded across my shoulders as the crowbar met skin, bone, muscle. He stood there silent, while I collapsed under the pain's weight. I turned slowly to see him raise the crowbar again, this time with intent gleaming in his eyes, no remorse. What followed was survival, pure instinct as I rolled away from each vicious swing, feeling its wind but not its bite. My body weaved through empty spaces left by objects long gone until an open doorway offered hope. My limbs strained and battered maneuvered through the threshold into daylight just as he seized my ankle. A twist and kick sprang me free and sent him staggering back. Outside now and alive— yet not without scars born from his relentless pursuit. Days later police questioned me at the hospital about him, about motives. A detective interjected with clarity. John Miller, ring any bells? John Miller, they said he'd been missing for years after his family's business went under. This place was theirs once. The man who chased me wasn't some embodiment of malice. He was broken by life's cruel turns. No one else entered that forsaken ground after Weister ghosts better left in peace. My wounds would heal but some scars are indelible, reminders of heavy swings and narrow escapes. Every long haul starts the same a deep breath, a check of the mirrors, and the soft hum of a diesel engine breaking the silence. That's where I found comfort, the routine. I'm Boone Riggs, and pushing my rig through hundreds of miles of asphalt lit only by moonlight and the occasional flare from distant oil rigs is what I do, what I live for. This particular stretch took me through remote parts of New Mexico, on the kind of roads you'd expect to see more jackrabbits than people. It was just past three in the morning when I rolled into a small truck stop near Truth or Consequences, a necessary pause to refuel both my truck and myself. The attendant, Casper Thorne, a lean man with skin tan like old leather, gave a nod as I walked in. Long night? he asked. Could be longer. I replied with a half-smile, grabbing an apple from a worn-out basket on the counter. That's when it happened, the inciting incident that shook my night. A frantic call over the radio relayed a message, a driver in distress some miles down Route 52. It took no persuasion. Giving aid is an unspoken code among those who navigate these lonely routes with coordinates scribbled on a napkin and an unease settling in, I ventured forth toward what I assumed must be another routine check. The drive was silent save for the crunching gravel beneath my tires and my own steady breathing. 
As headlights scanned the horizon, they finally settled on an overturned truck ahead. I approached cautiously, senses heightened with each step that drew me closer to the wrecked vehicle lying belly up like some metallic beast defeated by the roadside. There was no movement, no sound of distress, just an unsettling void that seemed to swallow my presence whole. It was then that I saw him, an imposing figure standing unnaturally still by the tree lean across the road. He was tall and broad-shouldered silhouette cloaked in shadows brought under scrutiny by my truck's lights, nondescript clothing hanging off his frame as if not intended for him. Hey! You need help? My voice wavered more than intended, a fact immediately registered with irritation. He made no response nor any indication he'd heard me, simply stood there as though carved from darkness itself. Unease skated up my spine reflexively as hands edged toward tools within reach. A wrench, always handy for repairs or other situations. A cold breeze stirred loose gravel underfoot. Nothing out of place yet somehow every detail felt charged with portent amidst this silent tableau. No humor could cut through this thickening air. Even jesting about odd late-night encounters seemed out of place against this sober backdrop, as if reality affirmed its seriousness with each thud of heartbeat loud in my ears. The figure started to move, marching with heavy purpose toward me. I held my ground, clenching the wrench. This was not a ghost story. This was a man, flesh and blood, yet something sinister clung to him like a second skin. He crossed the road, his boots crunching on gravel. Light washed over his face, revealing nothing but strips of duct tape where features should have been, a grotesque makeshift mask assembled in haste or madness. I yelled for him to stop but he kept advancing. My phone lay on the truck's dashboard. I thought of calling the police, but the figure was almost upon me, leaving no time. The decision to run rippled through me. Without pause, I turned and bolted toward my truck. He lunged at me from behind. His hands were large and rough, laced with scars and nicks that told of violence past. They grasped with an intention not just to harm, but to destroy utterly. I broke free and scrambled into my truck, starting it in a harsh roar. The man pounded on the window as I threw the vehicle into reverse. Tires churned up earth as I fled from him. In the rearview mirror, he stood motionless again, watching as if challenging fate itself. A few miles down the road I found a gas station and called for help from a shaking voice. The attendant eyed me warily but dialed 911 nonetheless. Cops arrived and went to check the scene leaving me sitting under harsh fluorescence with a stale coffee in hand. They found nothing but footprints leading into the woods and remnants of rope near the wreck. No sign of him or who he might be. Days passed with no news. There was no one reported missing or matching his description, a man without an identity it seemed. I took to avoiding that stretch of road, driving miles out of my way just to escape memories of that night. His blank mask haunts my thoughts still. People spoke in hushed tones about what happened to Mac Larson, though, the driver of that wrecked vehicle, how they found him or what was left after someone had their fill of violence on him. His name must be guessed from whispers around town, as they say he went by Carter, though for certain no one knew much about him. But every muttered tale agreed on one fact. Carter was not done with us yet. But what could we do against a shadow, a man stripped away from humanity by his own dark desires? We wait and hope that somewhere justice awaits him even if it's not within our grasp, even as fear grows like weeds between cracks in reality where normalcy used to lie before Carter walked among us.
There's something universally unnerving about sounds that don't quite fit the stillness of night. As a geneticist working for the U.S. government, I'm no stranger to odd hours or the eerie calm of a secluded woods, where our little-known facility nests, hidden away near the freezing expanse of Alaska's Denali National Park. My work, teetering on the edge of ethical boundaries, is tucked away from prying eyes, and for good reason. A feeling had been gnawing at me ever since Verdon Heidler, my close colleague and comrade in petri dish warfare, vanished abruptly last week. Things around here unravel in whispers and cold breezes. So there I was, immersed in data analysis when the usual low hum of the HVAC was split by an unfamiliar clattering outside the window. Inhibitions pushed aside by curiosity. I grabbed my trusty flashlight and sidearm, a standard-issue precaution, and ventured forth. Staring into an abyss of alders and spruces brought chills more akin to instinct than mere weather. They said when you feel that frost in your marrow, something's awry. Marla Quincy jogged up beside me, her lab coat flapping like a ghostly banner against her hurried steps. Did you hear that racket? She panted hand on her pepper spray as if it were a talisman. It'd scare off any damsel from these woods, and maybe that's what happened to Heidler. I joked, trying to light our mood as much as our path with my puny beam. We traced noises cutting through the bitter air until we stumbled upon surreal carnage, a sight punctuating our skittish banter with a brutal full stop. There, Amidst a chaos of items strewn from Verdun's scattered satchel, vials, papers fluttering like wounded birds, was a pool coagulating darkly under the indifferent moonlight. Marla covered her mouth in horror while I stood frozen by the implications burgeoning within my rational mind. Our radios crackled frantically with security call signs. Somber voices tinged with panic hinted something was cataresting our cloak of secrecy into broad vulnerability. As I hefted my gun and sounded my affirmative response into the device strapped to my belt, my warmth waned further seeing shapes dash between the skeletal treetops. My analytical side began teetering on Occam's razor. After all, there aren't supposed to be any beasts left here we haven't catalogued via genetics or observation. Then it materialized, cloaked in fragmented shadows, a heaving mass too grotesque for scientific dissection yet vaguely resembling lumberjack tales whispered by locals with too many gulps of beer and superstition. Eyes wide with an intermingling of horror and fascination, Marla stutter stepped backward as this monolith moved with predatory poise despite its dreadful asymmetry bearing down on us, a silent menace promising agony without utterance. Run! shouted Marley, though she needn't have. Every cell in my body brimmed with that singular instinct as I jettisoned reason over my shoulder like an obsolete tool no longer fit for survival's new rules. Flashes erupted from several directions as security engaged in a faltering dance of flashlights and firelines against an adversary defying identification, a gruesome tableau distilling mankind's age-old duel with nature into one sharp moment. I recall firing, not sure whether hostility or self-preservation prompted me, but amid flying lead and crushing uncertainty, there it was— Zealous revulsion gnawing within but not paralyzing action against this unknown devourer of safety's fiction. Our sprint became blurred, disjointed images jagged across adrenaline-marked perceptions. Marla's breath heaving like sobs against silence punched only by bursts of futile resistance. It seemed even bullets shied away from lending veracity to this nightmare's flesh. We staggered through the maze of corridors the creature's presence looming closer with each step. Marley stumbled, her footing nearly lost on the sleek floor, but recovered in time to avoid delay. She looked over her shoulder, her eyes wide with terror. From the dark emerged a figure not human, its limbs disproportionate, one longer than the other, 
awkward in its gait but swift. Security personnel exchanged looks of disbelief. Their training hadn't prepared them for this. Round after round they fired, but it was like shooting shadows. No tangible target presented itself. The creature seemed to absorb the onslaught with unnerving indifference. Upstairs, I gasped, pointing towards a stairwell that promised respite from the relentless pursuit. We ascended two steps at a time until we reached another floor and barricaded the door with whatever we could find, a file cabinet, chairs. We need to call for help, Marley whispered. I shook my head. My phone was dead, drained while documenting evidence of corruption I'd uncovered in my role as a compliance officer before this nightmare began. Marley's was lost during our initial scramble. The creature attacked the makeshift barricade, its power shaking the metal doors violently. A security guard who'd followed us aimed his weapon once more but blood oozed from a wound on his head and his aim wavered. It broke through, its form now visible in flashes as alarms blared erratically. It had skin mottled like decaying flesh and eyes that reflected no light, a void where life should have gleamed. As we turned to flee I saw our defense crumble. The guard screamed, a sound abruptly cut off as he disappeared into the grasp of this relentless hunter. His name was Eric. I remember seeing it stitched across his uniform just moments earlier. We ran from office to office, finding windows we could not open or break. Our hope for escape ebbed away as rapidly as our breath. Then, an opening, a vent large enough for us to fit through. We clambered inside just as the creature rounded another corner towards us. Sounds of ripping metal followed us into this tenuous sanctuary. We navigated through labyrinthine ducts by feel more than sight until emerging outside under cover of night. We moved away from the building in a frenzied escape towards neon lights and life. The city hummed in contrast to our recent hell. We found refuge in an all-night diner where people went about their lives unaware of our harrowed state. Someone spotted our distress, and soon the police arrived followed by ambulances. They listened to our tale with skepticism thickening their questions. In the days that followed I wasn't sure if what happened had led me down paths of insanity or clarity. The building was cordoned off. Officials quoted gas leaks and structural failure while newspapers speculated on terrorist attacks. The public never knew Eric, his sacrifice buried under explanations spun neat, away from truths too wild for comfortable consumption. We held a quiet vigil for him outside the establishment under restoration. That place harbored scars beneath new paint less vivid than those etched into survivors. The creature's origin remained unexplained, anomaly at best, fiction at worst in public accounts. But among whispers between those who were there lingered solid belief that it wasn't born of this world or any world known to mankind or science. When solitude allowed, I pondered what unfathomable place birthed such horror, and whether it still lurked in hidden corners waiting or had returned to wherever such nightmares spawned. But these were not thoughts for speaking aloud. They were silent reckonings, like countless others, dwelled upon privately after confrontations with things beyond understanding, yet undeniably part of our reality however much we wish them otherwise. Sometimes I think the allure of the great outdoors is just a well-marketed myth, especially when you work in the depths of wilderness where the chirp of your phone's signal is as rare as a genial IRS audit. That's where I found myself, in a cougar's overlay of Wyoming's untamed forests, home to my life of classified genetic tinkering at a government-restricted lab known only as Site Echo. In that clandestine zinc-clad structure hidden under a canopy of ancient pines and political red tape, I'd come to know Kean Wexler, 
whose mop of unruly chestnut hair never did fit under his lab hood right. Or Ada Sloan, whose sharp retorts cut as deep as her scalpel but dulled when concern crept into her voice. Dr. Rahan Badnagar was our lead, quiet but with an iron gaze that kept us all in high gear. Days morphed into a routine blur of DNA sequences and hushed conversations, never about anything other than the chaos of genes we seemingly rearranged on a whim. But one evening, it's not important which, as we sequestered ourselves in our research, readying for another round of gene splicing, an unmistakable stench wafted through the ventilation, iron-rich and clinging like bad news. Who forgot to incinerate their sample? Ada's grimace spoke before she did, roving over our poker face collective until Rayhun broke first. That's no oversight. He chimed in, moving methodically towards the door. It's coming from outside. With flashlights painting our route through darkened woods, we stumbled on the very antithesis of life our work so boldly championed, an elk, or what remained anyway. Mangled almost beyond recognition, black fluid, thick like tar smeared around its savage remains, a mockery of natural order. Kean voiced what none wanted to acknowledge. Whatever inflicted this horror ambushed with ruthless precision— no creature I know lusts with such particular savagery. Comments fell hollow against the abyss of unknowns that night conjured. There was no calling for help. Sight echo was autonomous, self-sufficient, or so policy dictated. We returned to our fortress of secrets with heavier steps and prying eyes drilling into inky shadows skirting the path. The following workday tension gripped like frostbite. Each click and hiss from our equipment whispering paranoia's dialect fluently. Ada commented on my jumpy disposition with a quip about dialing back caffeine before returning to her microscope. This isolation gets to you, eh? Kean tried lightening the mood over lunch, but silence consumed his jest faster than we did the meal before us. Twilight always tumbled too quick for comfort those days, and Dusk was particularly eager to introduce us to its friend Dread that evening. We were cleaning up when the power stuttered, a hiccup then darkness. I reached instinctively for the gun we weren't supposed to have, the one insurance policy against uncertainty. Illuminated by shaking beams once again outside, we discovered the backup generator shredded, the kind of destruction human vandals wouldn't execute nor possess the Herculean might for. Not vandals, Rayhan pointed out quietly but gravely at gouges on metal looking more akin to claw marks than tool scratches. The return trip saw eyes casting wide arcs into every crevice, searching for an assailant birth more from nightmare fables told by firelight than reality. Our whispered theories named no names but danced around images too terrifyingly vivid for comfort or sanity. Huddled in central control sans electricity, and saturated in a silence too thick to penetrate even with Kean's darkest humor about genetically engineering better luck next time, it happened. The building vibrated under an onslaught from something unknown venturing from fairy tales or cautionary whispers passed down from generations fearful of disturbing nature's unseen hand. A crash near logistics drew screams and hastened heartbeats as Rehan ordered us closer together while he took flanking position with his own firearm, a mirrored action to mind though unspoken agreement. We backed into the center of the room eyes darting to every entrance. There was no time to call for help. The nearest signal for our radios lay beyond the thick metal doors, and our satellite phones had met a similar fate to the electronics within central control. Dead, useless. We were on our own. The crashing sounds came again, closer this time, metal bending and concrete cracking under sheer force. Kean whispered a semblance of a plan, bolting for a set of large emergency lights that ran on isolated batteries. His hands fumbled in the dark, 
and soon a dim glow bathed the space in stark white light. Realization hit that perhaps light wasn't our ally as shadows cast by unseen objects began to dance across the walls. Another thundering crash and a scream cut through air, Lana's. We spun to see her being dragged away, her fingernails leaving trails on the floor as she tried to hold on to something, anything. Kian launched himself towards her. He never made it. Something struck him mid-leap. It moved too fast for eyes to register more than a blur. A gut-wrenching rip followed by a thud as Kian hit the wall across us. I looked at Rehan. We shared a wordless agreement. It was fight or flight now. We chose flight. Our path was riddled with debris from inside attacks. One could tell they were not random acts, but coordinated approaches aiming to hurt us somewhere specific. We pressed on, stumbling over torn metal sheets and shattered equipment until an opening ahead provided us with scant hope an emergency exit leading out into open space. Footsteps behind us grew in intensity as we ran. Leaping through the exit, we found ourselves on rough ground outside. The base seemed calm, deceptively so, as if we had stepped out of one world and entered another where peace still existed. We didn't dare look back until we reached what remained of our vehicle bay. Two ATVs still stood there intact, a stroke of luck amidst catastrophe, or so we thought until we started one up and it roared to life louder than anticipated. Like moths to a flame, it drew our pursuer out from hiding. It charged from back towards central control, large, bulky frame taking form, from matted with blood, its growls vibrating through air enough to silence the ATV's engine. In that moment I saw it clearly, muscles tensed under taut skin with each stride, eyes sharp but not human, a predator pure in form and function, one born out of necessity rather than malice or folklore ignorance. It didn't even flinch when Rehan began firing. Bullets seemed minor annoyances at most. We scattered as it pounced forward, Rehan one way, me another. From a distance I saw it bore down on Rehan who was still shooting until it was upon him enveloping him in shadows, and then it turned towards me. Heart pounding furiously against ribs I chose flight once more. I ran without looking back until lungs burned and legs threatened collapse beneath me. By some sheer act of providence, or simple exhaustion from its numerous assaults, the creature didn't give chase beyond base boundaries. It was content or perhaps bound in some way unknown to us mortals, to its territory within that cursed place where man trespassed one too many times with nature's sacred confines. I reached safety hours later. Bodies strewn around could tell no tales, but each missing person's absence told stories that words could not capture. I would give their names later during debriefings. Lana, Kian. Rayhan closer than any family member ever could be. Laying there in rescue chopper's harsh light feeling vibrations rise through seat as it took off back towards civilization. I knew answers wouldn't be forthcoming, not ones we'd understand at least, and while no tales or folklore would explain what happened here, that thing showed us realities some might say were better off left unexplored. But those memories... They live on regardless echoed by absence felt with each lost comrade who fell victim within those forsaken walls haunted now by ghosts of steel and flesh. I'm Tobias Westcott, in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park one of the most picturesque locations I've ever laid my eyes on. In between my college years, I spent my days wandering these very woods, taking in the breathtaking views and experiencing some much-needed solitude. Scroll forward a few years and I now work for an elite task force that specializes in hunting and tracking monsters. Something I never imagined I'd do for a living, to be honest. 
But life is funny that way. We received our latest mission briefing. There were reports of various people disappearing mysteriously within the national park. Locals suspected some sort of animalistic creature was on the prowl. My team comprised Martha Layton, who had a knack for sketching remarkably lifelike images of suspects based on eyewitness accounts, Falco Kearns, a communication genius, and Tommy Butler, an expert marksman. Searching for evidence deeper into the forest-afflicted area, we came across strange claw marks etched into trees. Trained not to jump to conclusions or let wild imagination run wild, we remained skeptical. We found a small camp where a hiker had set up residence before vanishing. The ground around it was churned up, implying signs of struggle. Following a trail of bloodstains leading away from this discovery site, we stumbled upon what seemed like leftovers of its latest meal bits of human flesh and torn clothing scattered around like confetti at a celebration gone horribly wrong. Not one to shy away from morbid humor even when faced with gory evidence before me, I remarked to Tommy. So much for peaceful woodland picnics. As we proceeded through the forest cautiously, Martha had been sketching images of locals who had been reported missing based on their photographs. We held on to hope that they might be found alive somewhere. A clearing in the distance revealed distorted footprints belonging to an unknown creature. That's when we heard it a low animalistic growl coming from the obscure woods around us. Our team was trained for encounters of this nature. However, feeling my heart race was natural considering the circumstances. Tommy signaled us to take up defensive positions while he aimed his rifle at any suspicious movement. Up in a tree far ahead, a grotesque creature appeared with a hideous form halfway between an overgrown wolf and a warped human figure. It glared at us menacingly as our weapons were aimed in its direction, but it made no immediate attempt to attack. It emitted another growl and lunged forward at great speed, causing us to momentarily think we'd lost sight of it. The battle had begun, and with adrenaline pumping through our veins, our focus remained sharp and ready for quick actions. Using selected firearms cautiously meant risking alerting any nearby campers or hikers. Emitting sharp bursts of fire from our pistols, we fought the mysterious beast that seemed determined to advance menacingly through the barrage. As Martha scrambled back towards safety, sketching a portrait of the horrifying creature hunting us while trying not to let fear consume her completely, thinking about the potential devastation it could wreak on the general public if not stopped soon. In the chaos, I tried contacting authorities, but our remote location and the frantic nature of the call made communication near impossible. Regardless, our priority was to incapacitate or kill the creature before it could harm us or, worse, make its way toward civilization. The beast charged toward Tommy, who managed to shoot it multiple times in quick succession. It only seemed to enrage the creature further as it pounced on him, sinking its fangs into his neck. Blood sprayed into the air as Tommy let out a muffled scream. Ishmael and I attempted to lure the creature away from Tommy by shooting at it and yelling. Despite being injured, it was fast and resilient. Finally, sensing that it was not going to get away uninjured, the creature retreated into the thicket hastily. We couldn't pursue it immediately. We had more pressing matters on our hands. Tommy's gruesome injury. We rushed over to him and attempted first aid. Ishmael applied pressure to the wound while I tore clothing strips for a makeshift tourniquet. Martha tried contacting emergency services again with slightly more success than before. She informed them of our situation and location. Time passed slowly as we waited for help. The pain was unbearable for Tommy as he continuously drifted in and out of consciousness. Suddenly, Martha shouted that she had seen movement in the trees as she continued talking with emergency services. 
We were all tense but tried to stay focused on keeping Tommy alive. Afternoon today. The nearest medical center is hours away, Martha muttered after hanging up from emergency services. Wounded but not dead, we prepared ourselves for another round with the monster. Ishmael and I surrounded Tommy with weapons at the ready. We wouldn't allow it another attempt at our friend. Hours seemed like days as we held vigil around Tommy, either Ishmael nor I straying too far from his side. The creature returned on several occasions, but we continued to deter it with gunfire. It bled profusely yet remained persistent. Night fell over the forest, and the sounds of wildlife ceased. All that remained was the sinister silence that preceded the creature's appearances. When help finally arrived at dawn, tired, bloodied, and emotionally shattered, we tried our best to recount what had happened to the authorities without sounding utterly insane. They seemed alarmed by our story but reassured us that they would launch a thorough investigation given Tommy's condition. Despite their promises, however, we suspected that nothing more would come from their efforts. It would all be swept under the rug as a strange case of an animal attack or be tacked onto the long list of unexplained disappearances occurring in these woods. As they rushed Tommy to the hospital, Martha shared her sketches with the law enforcement officers that were now questioning us. At first glance, they seem incredulous. However, Seeing her detailed illustration and comparing it to the physical evidence found near Tommy's wounds gave them pause. We left those woods feeling defeated and incomplete, failing to kill the unknown monster and knowing full well there was a chance it could still pose a substantial threat. Tommy survived after multiple surgeries and blood transfusions but would carry that deep scar for the rest of his life, both physically and emotionally. Martha destroyed her illustration of the beast, not wanting to remember its horrifying gaze, hoping instead to give us all peace by erasing any evidence that such an abomination existed. Ishmael enlisted in animal control afterward. He intended to monitor similar incidents vigilantly and ensure no other creature terrorized innocent people. As surreal as it seems looking back on it all now, the biggest lesson we took away from our horrifying experience occurred that fateful day in those woods. There will always be dark and unknown corners in nature where danger lurks. Facing it head-on sometimes isn't enough.